Okay. Hello. It's very intense, isn't it? For that, I, I need yeah, to. Yeah, you know, any, <laughs> everything that happens after that intro is a letdown automatically. Just so, you know. <laughs> so um, very Doctor Who esque uh, is what the vibe I was getting from it. It it is. I need to. What I think I need to do, and I will probably never get around to it, is sort of figure out a way to make the music fade out, but then the kind of image stay on while the music fades out. So then it is a bit more natural instead of it just being cool. super intense then cut off. But yeah, I'm not that not that advanced with my videography and audio and all that stuff. I just want stuff to work. Anyway, um, so today I'm talking to Richard Brown, who's got a, a YouTube channel of his own, but he's an actual philosopher, not just a philosophy <laughs> hobbyist. Uh, wait, I guess you pred predominantly talk about um, philosophy of mind over there, but sometimes, you know, some other things. Um, and also, you know, you kind of, there's not many people who are professional philosophers, but also um, kind of engage with, you know, a lot of the people who debate in this space online and stuff like that as well. So I think that that's something interesting that you do. Um, and so I guess the first kind of question I had for you is I saw a video you did on World Philosophy Day where you were talking about um, your approach to philosophy, kind of collaboration versus combativeness and also how you know like your perspective on what you see going on in sort of online public philosophy and so i was uh -huh. wondering if you could just open by talking about what your kind of view is of um the way that philosophy should be done disagreement should be handled and so on cool so you're the one who watched that video okay uh <laughs> by the way you didn't even notice that i went out of my way to wear that tie which was in the oh, picture that you put up. And this is the time, <laughs> uh, which by the way, that picture you found was, I don't know how you found it online, but that's from like 12 years ago. So I was like, whoa, I wasn't as great back then. But uh, anyway, It was the best one of you I could find though. <laughs> I should have asked. That's the best one, okay. Um, so anyway, I still have the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, obviously when you're talking about this sort of stuff, um, one doesn't mean to hold oneself up as always a champion, as living up to these standards. So I, I don't like want to come off as being, oh, you know, this look at me, how I've always behaved. Because actually that's not the case. And anyone who's ever known me, can, and you can even find this online, but even before online as well, that this is not the way that I've always interacted. I've always, uh, I used to enjoy like, not enjoy, but also like couldn't resist, I guess I would say uh, a kind of, you know, combative um, argument engagement style. And it was like, you know, thrilling in a sense, like a, like a chess game, but uh, one where there could be a fight. <laughs> uh, so I just think that while that, and while that feels very satisfying from the first person point of view um it's not productive at all and it it doesn't really um lend itself to an engagement with getting to the the bottom of things and this you know to getting at the truth but this is honestly something i'll put my glasses on now i only didn't wear the glasses because the picture i wasn't wearing glasses i was so young back then um but uh i think that this is something I've really been conflicted about. And I've seen you discuss things like, uh, related to this. It's not something I really talk about or think about uh, publicly a lot, but it has to do with like issues about wokeism and um, deplatforming and those sorts of things, which I think are in the same sort of ballpark because I think that, uh, you know, in, in this kind of aggressive style of like making the other person look like an idiot or um, undermining their position, that is a way of like, epistemically deplatforming them. It's not like, you know, booing them off the stage, so to speak, but it is a way of like, um, well. Like delegitimizing, kind of, yeah. That. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So anyway, so I think that that stuff uh, carries some merit. And a lot of, and you know, and I grew up where that was like, how people I knew interacted with each other anyway. <laughs> you know, it's like, so I get that, you know, some, and I, someone was just saying this on my channel recently when I was like criticizing Bernardo for being this way, they were saying, this is just how regular people talk. Like, this is just like bro talk. Like, this is just like, you know, Hey, you fucking dude, like, what's up, bro. And I was like, well, yeah, th that is kind of true, but you know, you can also do that. <laughs> I taking the view seriously. <laughs> and, like, 
Yeah. So uh, I think it's, uh, there's, there's, uh, it's one thing to kind of be, because I do believe, by the way, I'm getting really, really distracted already, but I do believe that like these normative claims about certain mannerisms or discourse or language are all real class patrol stuff. So like when people tell me uh, not to swear, I'm like, why the fuck not? Like, this is how people I hang out with speak. And if you think that's inappropriate or something, it kind of says more about like uh, where you come from in your background. Because like people I know, when they like something, they, they say they fuck with it. Like I fuck with that. So it doesn't sound like a bad thing to me. Also, anyway, so I think that those things, we have to be sort of aware of all that stuff. So some people engage in that way. And, and yeah, but also there's the seriousness of engaging with the argument and positions in a, in a credible sort of way. Anyway, so I'm getting way off of your initial question, but the initial okay. point that I'm trying to make is that when I think about how we ought to do philosophy, I think about it from a kind of two positions. One is like for me as a person, and then the other is like as a discipline. Um, so for me as a person, I think Socrates kind of had it right, that the kind of benefit of philosophy is knowing that you don't know, and then that's you know, and rather an important and profound thing that you could, you, could, you know, unpack or talk about. But as far as like a discipline is concerned, I think the job of philosophy is to try to map out a kind of conceptual space of and the argument structure that relates between them. And so when I'm trying to figure out like what I think, I'm, I think in the best case scenario, trying to think of the person I'm speaking with as a better, more informed version of me. <laughs> and I wanna say this to them. It's like, if I'm arguing with myself in my room, reading the book and I stop and say, hmm, how would Socrates respond to this or whatever? It's kind of like that, but then you're there. So I can say it to you and then you can come back and then you know, I might change my mind or whatever. So oftentimes I will like present positions, not because I agree with them, but because I wanna hear the response. Um, which led to you know me doing the consciousness live these kind of interviews because I am curious in finding out why people who are smarter than me arrive at positions that are not mine. <laughs> so I do think that it's important to recognize that you know lots of people are smart. And we're all like probably not unsmart. We're all smart, all of us. So if someone disagrees with me then, well, okay, given that this background assumption, they must either start from different assumptions or different interpretations of the data that we both have. And so my interest is in kind of mapping out those things and say, ah, if you start here, then where can you go? So I see it as, as a more collaborative effort, even when there's kind of spirited debates, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it as, okay, should I adjust these views that I have? Or is this link that I thought was there between these, um, these two things really that way or not? So um, in the public sphere, you know, I do think that there is a kind of real hunger to talk about these kinds of issues. Like people do want to talk about this stuff. People, people paint philosophy as this ivory tower enterprise, but I'm not from the ivory tower. That, that's not where I came from, but this is like stuff that's occupied me my whole life. And I, and the people that I have interacted with, I think, that there's this is people want to know the answers to these questions and that's why i make a big deal out of this video i have about what is philosophy it's like philosophy is is uh according to the way i think of it it's not really like a set of answers to questions um and, and, or it's not even a collection of distinctive questions themselves because i think these are kind of just human questions and, but philosophy is like a commitment to a certain approach uh to to these kinds of questions um so anyway, that's the way I think about these things. I don't know if that was at all what you were intending to bring up. No, it's, it, yeah, no, it's it, it's very good actually because I I enjoyed um, listening to that video of yours because I think that often, particularly academics, perhaps have a kind of idealized view of um, like philosophical discourse, right? And there's a sense in which like that's good, and that you know the the idea of um, debating just ideas and um, it being about exchanging reasons or something like that. And and I agree that that has a role and a place in it, but then there's also a sense in which some of that stuff can be performative, you know, like the idea of yeah. build who, who gets platformed, right? Can, can be like, well, I'm gonna legitimize 
someone who's like a softball version of a view that I disagree with, but make them right. look really good. And then that presents. So there's all these different like aspects and elements to um, public facing debate and philosophy and discourse that kind of um, come in. And then also, you know, if people do engage in underhanded things like trying to delegitimize you in some way or playing a bit outside the game of I'm just exchanging reasons with you, you know, where you want to be able to have a bit of an ability to bite back at that or something like that. So I thought the things that you were saying in that video about, you know, the two sides of like the collaborative side, and the competitive side, well, yeah, like you, the, the collaborative is great, but you almost need a bunch of things in order to trust people in the first place. And you want to be right. able to do the combative side if you're going to come across dicks and basically was the way I, I, I interpret what you were saying. I thought that was good. Yeah, and I don't always live up to that, by the way, because I get sucked into this. Like, I want to own the the libs as much as anyone else. I mean, I am a lib, so I want to own myself as much as anyone else. But it's like, you know, I, I do, I have, I mean, I don't know. I think of it as kind of a, <laughs> uh, as akin to like martial arts. So when I was, when I was young, I knew a guy who was very deep, into martial arts uh he was like a black belt and that was he was very very much um that was his whole way of thinking and way of life and he always kind of would say things like you know if you ever have to fight someone then they've already won uh because they've caused you to like lose control of yourself basically um if you know you can deflect and you can protect yourself and those sorts of things but if you ever if you ever really try to hurt someone then in a sense, that's um, a loss on your part. And I always thought huh, at the time, I was like, yeah, yeah, bro. But it actually, that's actually pretty, pretty right on in a way. Um, and there is this sense when you go into these debate rooms, yeah, when you when when someone starts talking that way, well, if you engage back at that same level, then in a sense, I view it as a loss of control. Um, and that's why I always say I don't really like arguing. Like I like thinking about these things and I like thinking through the issues and discussing them. But when it comes to arguing, like I, I, cause I get, I feel compelled to like, I'm probably like a reply guy or something like that. I just like, you know, there's something wrong on the internet. I have to fight that like constant urge to be like, no, it's less way. So and that's, I feel like a shortcoming in, in my own self that I don't want to amplify. And like when I was first being, um drawn into these discussions on discord and stuff i felt that side of me being activated uh and i did i don't enjoy it like afterwards i always feel like you know it's like when you're trying to uh, um you know be healthy and or good or something and then like you pick you know eat out you eat a bunch of uh candy or something and then afterwards like you don't feel great like you feel like that's how i feel afterwards like yeah okay even if i other people like oh you were really this or that it's like eh. I feel like I would like to hear what the other person said <laughs> rather than me ranting and raving. And um, so anyway, I don't enjoy that. And I look back on um, some previous videos that I can find of myself and thinking like, gee, uh, I was kind of missing the point that the person was saying and I was too like flushed or flushed, flustered. So obviously no one's perfect. And I'm not saying that anyone should live up to this perfect standard or anything. I'm just thinking that this is a, a kind of thing to strive for. And that I, over time, myself personally, have tried to aim more towards uh, and to try and encourage that more online as well. And that doesn't mean like everyone has to be polite. And I'm not trying to talk about toxic niceness, which I think could be a thing, actually. You know, so I'm not I'm not people can say, like, what the fuck are you talking about? I don't think that's a mean thing to say. So it's it's rather like, are we taking these ideas seriously in a serious way? and whatever you interpret that to be. And then people have different standards for what serious is and self forced and so on. So, um, yeah, that I'm, I'm much more interested in that, even though I, I tune into the dumpster fires just as much as everyone else. And I remember when I was a grad student, like, you know, when Dennett would debate somebody on, is there a God? I'd be like, yeah, get him, Dennett. But then like, he would be like dismissive of someone and be like, oh, that's just like the spaghetti monster. I'd be like, ah, there's more to the point there. That they're making like you could actually engage them it'd be more convincing if you'd actually talk about whether and then i that's when like the new atheism and that stuff was really 
it started to become more aware to me that this is not productive. <laughs> and then gradually over time, I realized that, gee, if we're really like serious about this, this isn't the way we should be doing things. Um, even though I agree like largely with what the side may be saying, I don't think I always like have been supportive of like the way in which those, uh, those things are done. Cool. So yeah, that I, I, I just wanted to ask about that at the start so people could kind of get a feel of your um, perspective as someone who's involved in like academic philosophy and um, also engages online of like, you know, the, 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 the virtues and things that are involved. So, to, but the main thing that I want to talk to you about as well is philosophy of mind, of course, um, which is what you talk about on your channel so often. So I wondered if you could give a sort of autobiography, right, of your of the history of your thinking with respect to philosophy of mind, if you can remember, you know, like, have you had um, various yeah, different yeah. positions and things that have changed your mind over time? You know, how how did your kind of thinking on these things go from uh, your point of view? Interesting. Um, you know, OK, yeah. Uh, I have a question for you, too, at some point, because I saw your video on the knowledge. Oh, OK, I have to, yeah, sure. I wanted to <laughs> ask you about that. Um, but uh, you know, I was kind of a, I don't know if you like want the whole history, but I'm old. So, you know, I've been around yes, for a while. A long and I, yes, it's a long history. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I'm kind of a non-traditional student. So I started at a community college uh, when I was 24, 25, something like that. And even though I had graduated from high school when I was 17, at the time that I was in high school, I was in a group home. I had run away from home and stolen a motorcycle. I was raised in a very religious, strict household. And at a certain point when they were forcing me to, well, it's a long story, but anyway, so I was either baptized or get out. And I was like, please then. So I ran away and um, I was arrested, put in juvenile hall, group homes and released when I was 18 then kind of worked in fast food basically i worked at mcdonald's and burger king and these other sorts of places in various odds and ends here and there um until finally i found out that because i had been in a group home i was eligible for some program that would allow me to enroll in the local community college and then they would also uh, give me money for books and i'd always loved reading um and i was like okay like free books basically so and i had by that time you know i was 24 or 25 and I had been out of the group home slash um, graduated from high school for you know six years already. So that's kind of a long time when you're young. Um, and I hadn't thought about school in a long time. I didn't think about this. I was trying to be a drummer um, and I was playing in a death metal band. <laughs> so uh, yeah, life was going well, as you can see, working at McDonald's and playing in death metal. Actually, it wasn't bad, I, <laughs> I recommend it. Um, so anyway, uh, and I, I went to school to this community college um, in California, and I did. I mean, it's funny when I look back on it because I'm like, why didn't I take a class in music? Like, I was trying to be a musician, but it didn't even occur to me to like think of that you could study music at school. So I just took like the Gen Ed classes and that they required, and one of them was a philosophy class. So uh, and there were other ones too. So there was like algebra and chemistry and Western civil or whatever so it's just kind of your general stuff and in the philosophy class i don't know i just it was one of those moments where i was like whoa um i didn't know that you, people took this stuff seriously because in my house where i came from this was frowned upon and you know i because i spent a lot of time arguing with religious persons who were trying to convince me of these things that i just found intuitively like not believable at all i was kind of just like immediately struck by the what uh i don't think so fat and among along many dimensions when i was uh exposed to the concept of god so i've just kind of never intuitively found it plausible and that caused all kinds of problems so it turns out that you know a lot of the things that i learned later i could see coming from you know, that weren't on my mind at that time like the problem of evil and uh the hiddenness of god and all these other sorts of things um, that people talk about so that's and i teach philosophy of religion now so it's interesting um but uh at, that's all i really i didn't know that i was doing philosophy <laughs> back at my home but i think in retrospect i was by having these kinds of arguments no one would have put it that way my you know my mom didn't graduate from high school and my 
father didn't graduate from elementary school as far as I know. So none of my family went to, went to school. So I didn't know about college at all. It was like a whole new experience for me, this whole concept. Um, so like I would read Descartes and I remember it's, it's kind of funny because I remember reading uh, the meditations in the like first paragraph. He's like, I'm sitting in my nightgown by the fire and I don't know what's real. Is this a dream? And I was like, holy shit, dude, is this guy on acid or like, what the hell? Like, this is like, these are the kinds of conversations that my friends had when we were tripping balls on the beach. Like, this is like, this is serious stuff. Like this isn't, um, you know, this is people, <laughs> people get paid to do this. Uh, so it was kind of eye opening in a sense. I was like, wow, you know, this is something I could picture myself doing. I was so naive, like completely didn't know what it meant to be a philosopher, didn't know what it meant to like professionally. I was just like, well, if, if this is what you could talk about, like what is real and stuff like that, this is like been on my mind since day one. So like, okay. Um, and that was a big op eye opening experience for me. And at the pre previous to that, I'd always thought of myself as like wanting to be learning more about physics and you know, dreamt of going to places like Caltech and studying relativity theory like that. When I was in high school, I was reading books on, well, relativity theory and the math behind it and trying to figure that stuff out. Because if it's someone had pointed out some philosophy to me, I probably would have read it and been like, uh, like it was written before 1980, I don't care. <laughs> so it was a real eye-opening experience. Um, and so I immediately, like that day after the first class, went and declared philosophy as my major. And I've had the same major the entire, I mean, you know, the same major, I mean, <laughs> uh, the same interest and focus ever since. So I uh, went on to a four-year college after that and got a bachelor's degree, then got a master's degree, and then transferred and got uh, a PhD. Along the way, I got a master's in uh, psychology and studied neuroscience and um, psychology as well. But it all kind of traces back to that moment when I was in that community college class. And I was like, whoa, this is, these are the questions that I've, that I was always told it was wrong to ask. And that in fact, somehow asking them was like an affront to like God or something like that. And I was like, but these are like the, um, these are serious questions that people talk about. And that, not only that, but there's a, there's a history of this. Like this is thousands of years old that goes back. I was just blown away. I had no, I was one of these completely like ahistorical kids who had made it through all the way to high school with no understanding of like history, <laughs> like at all. So it was just mind boggling to me that you could look back and see this long chain of discussion about these ideas. Uh, and I just instantly wanted to be a part of that discussion. I was like, so that's the audacity of, you know, I would say a little bit of white privilege looking back on it and, um, that I just immediately saw myself as fitting in. <laughs> I was like, yes, these guys are like the people I've been looking for. And now I can look back and say, well, you know, uh, coming from the neighborhood that I came from, I, there wasn't a lot of people that did look like me actually, but I, and I knew people that, you know, didn't look like me, um, who I wonder, who are just as smart as me, but I wonder if they could have made it like from where I did to here. And if they would have felt like they yeah. fit in, in the same way that I did. So I do recognize that as an element of like, um, I don't think it takes anything away from like how hard I fought to get there and yeah, like how yeah. hard I fought to get here. But yeah, I don't think that it's worth hiding thing. or ignoring yeah. either that that's like a part of what happened was that I felt like, oh, this was a conversation that people like me are having. Mm. Um, so, but, but at the time though, just to finish your, yeah, 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 my yeah. long-winded, sorry. <laughs> no, no, don't worry, it's all, uh, it's all right. It's all right. I was just gonna, I think, prompt you with what you're about to say. So go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Well, at the time I, I was pretty much like on board with Descartes. So I, I felt like, oh yeah, like dualism was clearly true. Uh, I, I thought the conceivability of my mind without my body was like, duh, obvious. Um, and, you know, myself personally being like an, a kid with asthma, um, who was raised as a vegetarian, but was also raised on welfare. So wasn't always nourished in exactly the way a vegetarian should be. So maybe wasn't as, you know, uh, healthy as I ought to have been. Um, so a, a skinny or scrawny asthmatic kid, I could, who was also like thought of themselves as smart, was good at chess, liked math. 
I could see why it was instantly appealing to me to like, oh yeah, I'm not my body. Like that's not me, this weak, frail thing that's like holding me back. Um, so it felt like very much satisfying for me to think of myself as not that body. And I remember thinking about that. Yeah, I'm this intellect, this thing that understands, this reasoning thing that, yeah, has experiences and so forth and so on. But those are contingently related to the body. I thought that was very clear when I first read this stuff. I was like, yeah. Um, and, you know, my own history, I've experimented with psychedelics. I've taken LSD, I've taken acid, these other things. And so I'd seen, you know, things, man. And it aligned with my sense that, wow, okay, like color inversions and quality inversions. Okay, so could we make sense of these things like physically, functionally being the same, but all this stuff being inverted? And, you know, I, it, it, it seemed to me very intuitively firm at the time, um, if I had thought about it. And by the way, as, a, as, a, as an aside, I was also working in a mortuary at this time um, and living at that mortuary as well and had some, like my job was to, uh, to collect the mortal remains of deceased persons and bring them to the mortuary. Um, and there's a lot, you know, it, so we'd probably best not talk about that. But anyway, so it was very interesting that I was reading all this stuff, thinking about dualism and also like on a daily basis, seeing dead bodies basically. Um, and I was thinking of them as like furniture, like this be respectful of the furniture. It's, it's valuable, but like the person's not here anymore. Um, so that was kind of my naive view. And I thought it was pretty obvious from this conceivability stuff uh, that the, the Descartes stuff kind of just knocked me over. I was like, yeah, duh. but I wasn't religious. As I was saying, I was also very much like a kind of a natural born atheist in a sense. I just couldn't see past the physicality of the world. Um, so I guess I was a bit of a dualist, <laughs> even though I didn't go around arguing about dualism or making a big deal about it. But um, I, I kind of remember that I was in my, uh, so long story to get longer, I graduated from the community college and went to San Francisco for four-year college. I went to San Francisco State University. And I went there because it was in San Francisco and that was it. That's, I wanted to go there. That's, that's, I didn't know anything about the school. And I had a couple other options that I had applied to, but I just wanted to be an SF. Um, so I went there and I was really unprepared. It was in the middle of the dot-com stuff. I ended up becoming homeless. My car got towed. I ended up living in the Tenderloin, being, living in the, like, staying on the, in the library in the, um, on campus and in the 24-hour section of the library, like sleeping in there until they kicked me out, basically. So it was pretty rough and I could have dropped out at that point. It would have been easy because I used all my financial aid money. I had nothing. I was like, it's a long story. But anyway, so I was there in SF and I remember I was in this uh, philosophy of mind class. And I was like, wow, I, I went there thinking I was going to like be interested in philosophy of language. Because at the time I was like, how the hell do words have meaning? That was like so confusing. So I was like really interested in that. Um, but I went to the philosophy of mind class and I, I, my interest switched like <laughs> instantly. I was like, whoa, this is the real stuff right here. And I remember having this discussion with all these other like students and everyone was arguing about the mind and like they, no one knew anything about the brain. And they were like, so we read something and, you know, it was in this, uh, this block anthology, the nature of, I have it back here, the nature of consciousness, philosophical debates. It had just come out. We were reading it. So I, I think I know, know the one you mean, actually. Yeah, I think I've got that somewhere. <laughs> Exactly, that big fat one. Um, so we were reading that and we were really lucky that we had a professor who knew or brought this book to us. And I didn't know that this class was a combined graduate student and undergraduate class. I had no idea about that. So a lot of the students I was arguing with were graduate students and I thought they were just like me undergrads, but I was older. So like, you know, I fit, they didn't, you know. So anyway, um, I didn't realize at all at the time that this was happening, I only kind of realized afterwards. Uh, but anyway, so, I just kind of realized that no one knew anything about the brain and because we were reading these papers and then we'd ask these questions and it would be like, no, we don't know the answer, but they're talking about the brain sort of like at this generic level, but they don't really yeah, know but the, anything the brain's about just, it. The brain's just kind of like one billiard ball hitting another. How can that give rise to consciousness? Yeah. 
Exactly. That's, <laughs> and at this time, there was this, well, functionalism was the dominant view and they sort of thought, well, the instantiation, it doesn't matter. Like you, you study it at the box and arrow flow chart level <laughs> and who cares about what's happening down there. And then behaviorism had also been popular and they were like, look, that's just internal wiring. What matters is a similar. So there's a lot of traditions in psychology and philosophy, actually, which kind of said, you don't need to know about the mind, the brain to know about the mind. And it was very much like alive in the way people were doing philosophy. Uh, and I didn't know any of this, but I can see clearly the trends. But now I think. But anyway, so I was like, you know, there are people that study the brain on this campus and they're over there in that building. So I went over there. <laughs> well, first, I mean, first I looked at the program for the college or whatever bulletin and I saw neuroscience psychology. So I just went over there and I was like, look, I'm a philosopher or philosophy student. Um, and I'm taking these classes and I just like want to take this class. Like, can I take it? Um, but I don't never had biology class. I don't know anything about biology. And they were like, uh, you're going to fail this class, but if you, you know, I don't recommend it, but go ahead. So I took like systems neuroscience and, uh, cellular neuroscience, which involved a fair bit of math, but I wasn't scared of math. Um, I just didn't know a lot of the stuff. Like, it was amazing. I'd be in these classes and the teacher would ask a question and the whole class would respond in unison. They'd be like, oh, so this is that kind of protein. So it has what structure? And they're like, I'm going to blend. I'm like, whoa. It was like, you know, being at church where they know how to respond in a way you don't. I was like, holy shit. So I was way out of my out of my league. But I started, like, thinking that it was important to know about the brain in order to talk about philosophy of mind. So I started taking these classes in psychology and neuroscience. And just one day I was walking from one of these classes to the other and I was thinking about, you know, I forget what exactly I was thinking about mental causation, but I, there was something that triggered it. It was something like bodily that I experienced at that moment that caused me, I forget what it was. I, I'll, let's just say that I felt thirsty or something and grabbed it. I don't know what it was, but it was something like that. And I started thinking, gee, look, okay, so here's this thing that just the mind just caused to happen. And my body responded in this way. And I was like, so how do you make sense of that? I don't. And as I was walking, I just realized it's it's the only way that I could think of that you could make sense of it was if the brain was the thing that was doing all the causing. And, you know, kind of just thought to myself, gee, that, that seems to me a good reason to think that that's what's there, really, that it's the brain. I think and it just, just kind just of dispelled dualism for me. <laughs> so, 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 so I know on the, I know uh, you've not completed uh, talking about your full kind of journey of intellectual development around the mind. So we'll talk talk more ab about about where you went from there. But this is actually something that I commonly observe with people who take like non natural or non physical views of the mind. Right in general, is that often there has not been a kind of attempt to engage with a lot of like the, the neuroscience and stuff. And so a, a lot of what goes on in these like intuition pub type scenarios that are constructed is that they basically yeah. set up some kind of distinction between the physical and like, you know, consciousness as it's conceived. And there's some kind of the, the concept of consciousness is, you know, you can say they've been maybe trained to think about it a certain way by philosophy of mind as well. And then um it's like well if you actually spent a bit more time talking about some of the science where maybe they try and just work on some smaller problems with a bit better operationalized you know questions than the ones the, these like broad questions then all of a sudden your intuition has become very very different right about yeah. the nature of explanation what fits what and so on. like and, and it's not necessarily this one this one thing where you're like oh yeah now I just, but just gradually over time your sort of intuitions and things change to the point you're like oh actually it's I can true see that yeah yeah i mean it's because in the class you know in the neuroscience class we're talking we're using the nurse equation to calculate how certain neurons would respond in certain circumstances and then studying how like a crab's law the pincher response of the crab and when you look at the i mean it's not completely 100 percent understood but it's pretty much understood uh, in some level of detail. And when you look at what's going on there, it's like, where's the room for anything else to happen? It, it, so it, that's, the, to me, the like the substance dualism stuff, at least from the Descartes version of it, I've just always felt like we, we would have seen by now something in the brain, some event 
call it N, which when we looked at it and say, why did that happen? We would just not find an answer. But every time we look, we do find an answer. We're like, okay, well, why did that happen? Oh, these ion channels opened. Why did that happen? Aha, because the voltage difference across the membrane was different. Why did that happen? Well, because there were more potassium ions that were flowing this way. And it's just every step of the way, there's a mechanistic answer to the question, why did that happen? And by the end, you have like the pinching of the claw. So now I don't think that that rules out that we would ever possibly find something like that in the brain. And I always like, you know, compare the electrical working of the brain that we have now with the way they used to think of it as like a hydraulic system in the year, you know, a thousand years ago. And they didn't know anything about the electrical activity of the brain. So, you know, there always may be some new thing in the future that we discover how to measure, which was there always, but we can only now pick up on. And, you know, we can't rule that out, I, I don't think. But uh, given what we do know now and barring anything like that, then I think that uh, it would be very surprising if we did find a kind of spontaneous uh, occurrence in this way in the brain. Um, and But that's kind of the natural prediction of dualism, right, of, of, of this kind of substance dualism, which is that, you know, some event in the mind causes something in the brain. And so the answer to what is the cause is that thing up there, and you can't find it in the physical stuff. And so when that occur when I occurred to me, like what actually like here's this thing we were discussing, like it was a very concrete thing. Like here's this neuron connected to this, this fires in this way, it causes this change down there. And there you go. Okay, so obviously we're more complicated than that, but but uh when you consider that, it doesn't seem like we have any evidence empirically for there being this kind of extra cause. So uh, it seems like, therefore, and, and then when you talk to philosophers about this, say, well, what about overdetermination? And it's like, okay, but if, if the physical thing hadn't caused it, then the mental thing would have. And it's like, so there's all sorts of debate that ensues. That's not the end of the story. But at the time for me, it, it really made me start to think about something which has become a major theme of my work and something I always rant about, which is how it is that things can go from like seeming so clear and then learning something empirically and having that go click <laughs> um, and then making you wonder, gee, in all these other cases where things seem so clear, what empirical thing could I learn possibly, which might make me change that view. And so that that really has become my, and now, I mean, I hadn't thought about it until you kind of brought this out, but I think that's kind of become a defining feature of the way I think about these things is I think no matter how certain we are from the first person point of view, there's always a question about what kind of empirical thing could we learn, which might make us change our mind. And I think that goes all the way down almost uh, as far as you can go. So, yeah, cause I th so I in think a way, yeah, I did change my mind. And that was the beginning of this idea that I had that, okay, we need to be less sure of ourselves <laughs> and we can't just go around saying, Intu intuition therefore fuck you <laughs> so, <laughs> which is so a where, style of argument by the way <laughs> so so where, where did your thinking kind of go from there that like with, with respect to the philosophy uh debate in philosophy of mind in particular were, were there kind of any other key things that you found out or key debates whatever that kind of really shaped what your views have become now um or was that that the main difference and then since there it's been kind of like fleshing it out almost yeah, I would say the other one is just like my encounter with Dennett, which was uh, around the same time. Not, I never met him personally. I've been emailed him a few times, but uh, you know, I've never met him in person. I've been at the same conference as him in the same room, but anyway. So what I say encounter with Dennett, what I mean is his ideas uh, in his writing. And I remember reading uh, in this same class, by the way, this philosophy of mind class, um, I guess there's now that I'm thinking about, there's one other thing I'll mention after this, but uh, in the philosophy of my class, we read Quine and Qualia and Time and the Observer, which are classic Dennett papers. Um, uh, Time and the Observer, he wrote with another guy, Kinsborn, I think is his name, um, but Quine and Qualia is all him. So I just found Dennett's views to be 
like at the time I just thought they were ridiculous. I, I mean, I just thought, dude, who is this? You know, I probably would have been the one of those guys like, oh, I can't believe people get paid to do this. Consciousness <laughs> explained. Consciousness yeah, explained uh, away. Yeah, yeah uh, zing, zing, <laughs> ha, 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 zing. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I was very much influenced by Searle at the time. I have to say Searle was over there in the Bay Area. He was in Oakland or, uh, sorry, sorry, Ber Berkeley. Um, and I never met him uh, either, but um, I, I went to talks of his and I read his book, Consciousness Rediscovered or whatever it was. And it turns out he's a scumbag and it's like really a, a fall of a hero in a way. I, I talked about this recently in a video, but I was like, like, I didn't know him personally, but he was someone who I admired the way he did philosophy. I was like, down to earth, no bullshit. Like, this is like what I admired. Um, his emphasis on biological naturalism and the brain. I was like, yeah, finally, someone's making some sense around here. So I, I really like admired his views and his way of doing philosophy. And now I look back on it and I'm like, uh, ew. <laughs> so I, I re recently rewatched one of these videos and I, I don't, I think he, he's like, as I said in the video, he's the Bernardo of, of physicalism. He, he is like dismissive and condescending and character. So it's entertaining to watch though. And, you know, and, and it was like, a, and it's supposed to be a talk, in that kind of talk. Anyway, so um, the, the, the thing that really annoyed me was this idea that consciousness isn't there or something. And in the Quining Qualia paper, where Quining means to get rid of something that's obviously there, it's an inside joke to deny the existence of something that's obviously there. Um, so, you know, I, I just felt like it was a kind of verificationalism he, at the time that, cause I was very much an undergraduate. So I thought I was like, aha, verificationalist, verificationalism, bad. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you verify uh, but, that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's how I, I still think his view is like, he's like, well, if you can't tell the difference between kids born and, or what is his, uh, Chase and Sanborn, the, the, the case of the coffee drinker who they both don't like the taste of a coffee they used to like but in one it's the same taste he just doesn't like that taste anymore and in the other it's a different taste um which is than the previous taste and that's the taste that they don't like they would have liked the original taste but it's this new taste they don't like and so then basically his argument is you can't tell the difference between these two from the outside from any functional test or whatever so therefore there's not a real difference between them and at the time i was just like dude what the fuck are you talking about obviously in reality, there's a real difference between these two options. And if we can't figure out a way to test it, then why would, what are we, you're just gonna go around saying it's not there. So I was very much like, what is this guy talking about? Um, and now I realize it's it's a, much, a lot more complicated. I, I'm talking about an undergraduate who's completely unschooled in these things. But it really drew me into this like, but consciousness is real, damn it, mode of, <laughs> of, of discussion, which still very much is something I have to deal with these uh, illusionists and so forth. Um, so, and, and I was in this undergraduate philosophy of my uh, other class, modern philosophy class, reading Descartes. And the professor said, as one of our homework assignments, try to think of something Descartes never doubted. Um, and I said, you know, he never doubted that he was conscious. <laughs> Whereas this guy over here, Dennett, is over here doubting if he's fucking even phenomenally aware of anything. It just like boggles my mind. So I was like, Descartes' doubt's not radical. Dennett's doubt is radical. That's radical doubt that I might be a zombie. Dennett says, you don't know if you're not a zombie. At the time, I was very much like, I don't know I'm not a zombie in this incredulous, but have you taken acid sort of like and seen Santana play sort of way, you know? So it's not a, uh, I think it's more complicated than that, obviously, but th that was one of the things I still think is very much on my mind to this day. It's like, okay, physicalism, but phenomenal realism. Consciousness is real. And I don't like mysterianism. I know you're going to talk about uh, quietism with Pete. Um, coming up soon. I don't like that. I don't like illusionism. I don't like people who say we have to only talk about access consciousness. I don't like people who say, what do you mean by phenomenal consciousness? I just think all of these things are like ways of dodging the, the, what I view as the primary explanatory target of the science of consciousness, this real feature of the world um, that actually exists. And that I like have been thinking about my whole life, I feel like. Um, so anyway, that's still very much a theme. Um, and then finally, third is that I also at SF State, which, you know, I can't recommend it enough, these places where they're affordable, 
it was like pennies on the dollar basically to go to school there and looking back on how much it's uh, amazing these are people that were there dedicated to helping dumb shits like me come um because they said oh you're you know at the time they were very much like we love meeting students like you and i was like like me i'm an asshole but actually you know now i'm i agree i love meeting students like me people that actually care about this stuff that are intellectually curious and that want to follow the argument that want to go where does the argument go and not try to pick the conclusion first um, and say, how do I get there? <laughs> but actually map where the argument goes in, a, in, a, in as honest a way as you can. Um, anyway, so the third thing I would mention is that I, I discovered existentialism um, and I read a lot of Sartre. And I had a kind of like very profound experience um, reading Being in Nothingness in the fog in San Francisco, um, which was a very being in nothingness kind of vibe about it. So like those ideas i think still uh still are in the background of my thinking ideas about what a person is what it means to be human how that relates to transhumanism um i think that existentialism has something interesting to say about that the idea that essence precedes existence or existence precedes essence uh, you know this so i think there's interesting things there and i also you know like to think about Sartre as this weird guy doing methamphetamines and the French Revolution. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's those th themes. I don't write uh, professionally about existentialism and I'm kind of just an amateur, but I do think that when I'm, when push comes to shove, a lot of things that I tend to say can be traced back to thinking about existentialism. So, so then in terms of mapping out what your well-formed views are, right? So, so people can kind of have some idea of how you um, approach these things. I mean, maybe we could go through some of the kind of classical arguments or something one by one, but is there like a, a label that you would want to identify your view with or like, you know, an overarching kind of metaphysical view that it sits quite firmly in or something like that? Um, my view, uh, no, I don't, yeah, I don't think so. Um, it's all right as I well. Guess, yeah. <laughs> I guess my view could be called who the fuck knows ism. <laughs> uh, or this shit is hard ism. <laughs> so uh, I really think it's difficult. And I don't, my, my considered view is that physicalism hasn't been shown to be false, but we don't know if it's true. And I don't think these other views have been shown to be false either, but maybe there's less reason to think they're true, but maybe some reason to think they're true. So that if you laid out all of the possible ways the world and the mind might be, mm. then I would say that I think that probably physicalism isn't false, mm -hmm. or at least we don't know it. Um, and that's what I defend the most often. And people think of me as a physicalist and, uh, you know, I've written papers where, and people accuse me of being that physicalist motherfucker. And I was like, okay, so I'm friendly to physicalism. Um, I think it's not known to be false. I don't think a priori arguments show to be false, mm -hmm. but I don't think we know that it's true. So I think that's important distinction. Uh, so maybe this is just kind of agnosticism generally across. Yeah. The that's board, what I was going to ask. Up. I was going to say, would you be happy with that kind of label for the view, like a, a, a philosophy of mind agnostic or something almost, but with a sympathy yeah, to a directed it, yeah. agnostic though, because I'm not like a Russellian teacup agnostic. I'm, I mean, yeah. in the philosophy of religion, I think of myself as an agnostic as well, but not like the Russellian not yeah. agnostic, because I don't think it's equally likely that there's a Zeus. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think the I think there's some evidence. I saw some discussion of yours about this recently, some evidence for a designer or creator of some sort, depending on what you mean for, for by evidence, maybe some evidence for something more than that, but that depends a lot on what you mean by evidence. But generally I would sum up my views there is like, it's more likely that we're living in a simulation than that any of the known religions are true. <laughs> yeah. And that, that all of the, all of the traditional arguments for God's existence, except the ontological argument, better support the simulation hypothesis. So that, that so, but I'm still like officially agnostic um, on whether there is some kind of designer, whether it's a simulation or something else. Um, but uh, 
I'm definitely not agnostic about like the God of the Bible, the God of the Torah, the God of the uh, Koran. I'm pretty much an atheist about those guys. Um, Zeus as well. So, but this more general abstract category of is there a designer and what are the attributes of any of that thing? I'm kind of um, a traditional agnostic in that sense. Although I think there's evidence on both sides, so not a really a traditional evidence. I, I, I agnostic. I think kind of it really personal preference is going to be the only sway in doing yeah, yeah. Um, well, that. I, that, there was actually a, a debate that I ha hosted between a guy called Joe Schmidt, who you might know, and uh, James Fodor, my co-host, on talking about, you know, like, how should we consider kind of agnosticism and atheism? Because I think some people have, uh, make a very kind of strict case for the way that, you know, something like agnosticism should be considered. So people say, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it in this sense or that sense, but I think there's a lot of different ways in which one can kind of be an agnostic. You know, there, there's a general idea of undecidedness one way or another but it doesn't you know it doesn't necessarily mean like i'm 50 50 it might mean i think uh, there's just not enough justification i should withhold my judgment in some way or i recognize the complexity of this field and yeah i just can't well yeah, i would yeah, say like, it differently but, i would say that given my personal nature and background that i have kind of pessimistic take on the evidence but i can right. see how someone with a less pessimistic nature a background like you know for me i i don't know People say everything happens for a reason. I immediately think of all the animals that are slaughtered for eating, all the all the yeah. torture, and, you know. And I, I'm just like, really, everything happens for a reason. Like, pat, pat, pat. so like that's because I've had a lot of bad experiences in my life, but yeah. a lot of people haven't. So maybe they're thinking. So maybe it's just my my nature, my own personal experience that's biasing me. That's kind of the mm -hmm. source of my agnostic. Maybe if I were like a better person, <laughs> I'd be uh, more convinced <laughs> by these arguments is sort of, or a different kind of person in other words. Yeah, yeah. Um, and less, less, uh, less pessimistic, just generally speaking. Because I can't even really bring myself to take seriously the idea of a loving uh, being creating all of this and then it being like this. Like I just can't, like it just, it, it just short circuits my mind. Like my brain just like haywires when I'm like, wait, so all loving, all powerful in this, like, I, and then you could do backflips and try to explain that away. But I just well, that, think that's like, just I'm a no see him. Of... That's just a no see him inference. Uh, just because yeah. you don't see God's reasons, you're <laughs> exactly. So that's what I mean. Maybe I, if I was more <laughs> less pessimistic, but I, you know, yeah. I read Dostoevsky uh, and I was like, yes, <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Like, if one child suffers, I was like, no. Mm -hmm. If I stub my toe, like that's enough. That the toe oh, hurts yeah. so bad um but cancer doesn't like this is already a design flaw already like this is enough um yeah. and you know my not to get distracted but you know and then they people talk about free will a lot but i've always had the, the the response that there's lots of things we can't do but it doesn't mean we're not free so when i was younger i wanted to be able to jump to the moon yeah oh yeah i really wanted to like i'm not this is not a joke like i have i had yeah. the desire to yes. be able to jump to the moon and I will never be able to do that. I felt very frustrated. And people are like, it's just not possible. And I was like, why the fuck can't yeah. I do this? I want to. So, okay, uh, I don't see why evil couldn't have been like that. Like something maybe just really bad yeah. they wanted to do, but just wasn't physically possible. So I've never seen I mean, a good response to that way of I, arguing I, against. The way, the way I think of, of that one as well, and it's obviously there's a slightly different sense of freedom at play, right? But it's kind of like... Uh, you know, if, if you kind of sign up to the idea that, say, people who commit certain crimes should be put in prison or something, you know, you, you kind of agree to limiting their freedom in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. You don't you don't think their ability to be free is just so valuable that it justifies letting them, you know, go on to commit murders or rob or whatever it is that they were doing. And now, you, you know, I, I can see how you can make it work still and say, well, that, you know, there I mean freedom in the sense that their powers allow versus you know freedom in the libertarian sense which is the ability to do that yeah but and then the stuff well, i think even if you allow the, the libertarian sense in that yeah. god should have made the world where people only libertarian freely choose to do what's right and to say that he couldn't have is like already a kind of a uh, weird thing to say but anyway so yeah. uh, I don't want to get, I mean, if you want yeah, to talk about that, stuff, I'm happy no, to, no, it's, no, no, it's sort yeah, of not no, related to the philosophy of mind stuff, but, uh, yeah, but I do have views in this area. Yeah. So, you know, so there, was, I'm, I'm, there was a question though, a, que a question then about your characterization of your own view on mind is just how, how would you understand physicalism as well? Because obviously there's a lot of 
different ways that people can understand what that means? Um, is there one particular one? That, when you say you're sympathetic to physicalism or your views are sympathetic, what, what does that mean to you? Uh, yeah, so I, th I think the, the easiest way to answer that question is, is that, it, well, there's a lot of ways to be a physicalist. Um, some versions of physicalism we already know are false. This is something that Daniel Stoljar points out a lot. By the way, before I go down read the rabbit hole, I want to mention that I do know who Joe Schmidt is. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have seen James, you, you and James talking. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think I read a, a paper of Joe's recently on the Grim Reaper paradox, uh, which I thought was very interesting and fascinating on forward looking Grim Reaper paradoxes. Um, which he got, you know, he's he's a very smart guy, and he's uh, been publishing papers, putting us all the shame publishing papers as undergrad before he was even grad. Yeah, it's like a twelve year old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So no, that paper is extremely fascinating, and interesting, and um, I have all kinds of things to say about Grim Reaper paradoxes as well. But anyway, so I really respect the work he's doing, even though I don't always agree with everything he says, um, but I agree with most of it. Uh, so. I physical forgot what physical yes physical, physical. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. like one version of physicalism was the was by from democritus you know democritus these guys like the ancient greeks they they had every variety of view that you could imagine i mean democritus the ancient atomism thought that the basic building blocks of stuff was just little like solid bits of matter um so and the only difference between the ones he assigned to perception or the soul, the mind, and the ones out there were the shape. Like they had a, a, a kind of, um, a, a, not spherical, but crescent shape. Uh, whereas all the other ones were more angular. <laughs> and so according to him, and of, of course, according to him, they had every variety of shapes because the principle of sufficient reason, why would they only have some shapes versus others? So the principle of sufficient reason suggests atoms have every possible shape. So one possible shape they would have is this kind of crescent shape that's the one that gives us the ability to sense and perceive um he thought ghosts were just these bits of atoms without uh the the atoms corresponding to the body they were these just the mind atoms or something like that he thought maybe even the gods uh like the zeus and these guys might be physical like made of these atoms things so democritus was like that's physicalism dude just just shape like that's the only difference between so I, that's pretty hardcore physical. I'd say we we know that kind of materialism is false uh, because the world isn't like that. As a matter of fact, as a matter of empirical discovery, Democritus's view, Democritus's views are um, not true. So uh, if if what you mean by physicalism is that there are little bits of material that are distinguished by their geometrical shapes, then you know that's clearly not the case. So obviously the word physical has gone through many transformations um, and that's why people, modern persons, contemporary, I mean, prefer physicalism to materialism. Often it is the case that they want to distinguish themselves from this older view that the world is material. And the modern view is that, well, it's not. <laughs> there may be matter, but it's fields. It's matter and fields. And maybe matter is a kind of field actually. So maybe it's just fields. Um, so it certainly whatever those guys were talking about um, doesn't seem to be like the way, or at least if our physics is right, it could be wrong um, in the long run. Uh, we have some reasons to think it's not complete and all that stuff. So obviously, but given what we know now, many modern physicalists use that term because we don't think of the base level of reality as being little bits of stuff with shape. Um, it's something else. So what else is it then? Well, you could go different, and this is what you're asking. Like, what do you mean by, and I guess you're asking what I mean, but what I mean, what I think is that I mean, it's complicated, so you have to go through all these options. Um, so you could say, well, what's physical is what's mathematizable. And I think that's roughly, largely the way people use it. So to, to put it um, more in terms of the debate in philosophy of mind, it's what entails structure and function. So structure is like what the thing is built out of and function is what it does. And hopefully you'd be able to ma mathematically describe these things. And so if you look back at Descartes, this is you know one way that he's characterizing the difference. I mean, he puts it in terms of extension, things would take up space. So maybe we'd quibble about that. But actually, I don't know. 
you know, one of the reasons I've always been interested in string theory is because they start with strings, which are one dimensional objects. And I always thought it was weird that physics starts with uh, point particles, which have no dimensions. And then we're supposed to say the world around us is made of dimensionless points. Like that's weird. Um, so at least string theory starts with something with a dimension. <laughs> it's only one dimensional, but it's a dimension. So you don't get such a, a weird leap from none to some. Uh, whether that means it's true or not, I don't know, but that's intuitively one of the things that I always, and I was one of these guys who found out about string theory, like when I was in high school and I was like very interested in this stuff way back then. So I've been following this for a long time. Um, but anyway, so you could mean like what's mathematizable. And when people like, I'm kind of like part, I, I have some level of credence, belief, whatever, in ontic structural realism. Um, which basically says what, what's real, what's physical is just the structure of the stuff. And what that is, is what's the mathematical. So when Newton changes to Einstein, what's the same there is all the equations. Um, so Newton's theory doesn't get falsified. It just becomes a special case of the more inclusive theory. But those equations are so the, the structure is preserved. And by structure, we mean the mathematically formalizable relations that we're talking about. Um, like the relationships between F and force and mass and acceleration and uh, so forth. Okay, so those things are all preserved. And so that's probably, maybe you could mean that by, um, and, and the ontic structural realist thing, you, you have to kind of take lessons from various physics and conclude that that's what the base nature of physical reality is. So I take that seriously. Um, on the other hand, in my uh, less demanding moves, I think, look, by physical, we just mean it's not mental. So I actually technically don't even really care what the base level of reality is, as long as it's not like Philip Goff says it is, and that you don't have to talk about phenomenal consciousness or awareness or what it's likeness or any of these other, what I take to be psychological features of human beings and other animals. Uh, and if those features are at the base level of reality, then, okay, you know, what you call it whatever you want. It's not what I want to preserve or what I'm thinking of as physicalism. So in some sense, I think, yeah, all these debates, you could get trying to get, and people try to say, we can't even say what it is. In a sense, yeah, maybe you're right. But I, this is with the via negativa, the negative way um, of saying what the physical is. That's just that which is not mental. And a part of me is fine with that. So what, if I would be happy if like this was all a computer simulation, but at the base level, it was just something physically that was simulating us. I would still say physicalism is true, even if like we live in some, upper level of the reality. So in, 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 in a way that I could even go as far as saying that which is physical is <laughs> the common sense thing that we're talking about, the stuff that we can touch and taste and smell. And in that way of thinking, then whatever consciousness is, it shouldn't be any different than water. So if you, if you do that though, then it kind of loses meaning altogether. And you're like, okay, so you could be an idealist and be a physicalist in some sense. And yeah. Well, if, this if was you something think I was going to ask, actually, was, was do you think that that view of physicalism, obviously, like Castro describes himself as like a naturalist, for example, and I know, I know you might want to distinguish between naturalism and physicalism, but I, I kind of find that a bit odd, at least, because I would have thought that that maybe the role of a word like naturalism is always to do something like exclude views like Castro. You know, it seems like rather than it being some. But what about views like Chalmers? less clear i suppose and even even goffs i kind of struggle to understand because it seems like he's almost proposing a revision of um physics in a way to be inclusive of a particular property so it's like it, it seems more physics like in a way where i'd be like i'm not sure i'd exclude that from like naturalism but there's some elements to it that seem a little bit unlike naturalism because they're a bit spooky or something yeah yeah um I think, uh, I mean, these words have a long history, obviously, and people have used them in all sorts of ways. So naturalism and empiricism are words that get thrown around. But I, I so, you know, I once was out <laughs> um, standing at a bar actually, and David Chalmers was next to me and some like young graduate student came up and they said, 
oh, hey, you're David Chalmers. I've heard about you, but I don't know anything about you. What's your view about consciousness? And he like, Chalmers was there and he like looked at me and he was like, ask this guy. <laughs> and I was like, um, he doesn't think consciousness can be explained by science. And Chalmers was like, no, that's wrong. I don't think it can be explained by physical science. But I do think that there is a scientific or a science of consciousness and that it's a mistake to say of me, David Chalmers, that I don't think that consciousness can be explained by science. Rather, it is that I, I David Chalmers, think that science has to be expanded to include consciousness as a fundamental element in something like the way that fields were included as a fundamental element um, so that they, uh, they didn't become explainable by science. They become the things in terms of which you offer explanations in science because they're introduced at the fundamental level. So that, that was a long time ago. And the reason why I bring that up is because I think this is relevant to your question, which is why these guys want to be called naturalists. Um, it's, it's that they want to associate themselves with science. They want to say, look, we can do science. We're not anti-science. Um, Chalmers is all for the science of consciousness. Uh, he's done a lot of work, even you might think, in sort of helping the science of consciousness get started. People could disagree with that. I know people might be, uh, there's a lot, there's, I don't, we don't, there's a debate about, has it just been harmful to the science of consciousness? It might be related to the IIT stuff, which has been going on, but that, so there's, you know, so there's a debate there. But anyway, so I would say he's been helpful to the science of consciousness, um, even though I don't agree with his views. I, I agree with the way a lot of the debate is set up. Um, I think he has mapped out the conceptual space in a, in a useful way, um, which I think has helped contribute to what I would call progress in philosophy, not towards truth, but towards mapping conceptual spaces. <laughs> um, so, uh Naturalism, then, in that sense, is this idea that things are uh, uh, amendable to scientific study and explanation. Um, and if you have to expand science and, you know, so you don't want to, yeah, maybe that's going to be the case, but it's not tr getting rid of science, going beyond science or, or you know, saying that it's, it's, it's an expansion of the science. And so the idea that consciousness is part of the natural world which could be in some sense incorporated into a scientific worldview, if you don't equate that with physical science, um, is the kind of view I think that David Chalmers is trying to defend and why he spends time writing papers on quantum mechanics and dualism and these other sorts of things where he's trying to say, look, how would you, how could it be part of the natural world? And the one that science is trying to talk about, do we have to expand what that means in some sense? Um, not like, go beyond it and so so it's really in my mind i was equating it back then i was equating science with physical science and i think a lot of people do and chalmers's quest in a sense is to try to get people to to open up their definition of science to take consciousness seriously and to include it in the things that science takes seriously and then ask what would you get I, so so within, within um the sort of um story about Chalmers there and uh, and how that might change someone's view on the bounds of science I do like I I'm definitely sympathetic right to what he says he's trying to do there I think though like the for me and I don't know how exactly I draw this boundary that there, there is like a boundary between what say someone like Chalmers or uh, maybe maybe Goff's a little bit more towards that border than I'd say Chalmers is and then I'd say like Kestrup's definitely over that border for me in terms of like what I would consider actually trying to produce scientific explanations rather than just completely almost like turn the world on its head into like a, a, a completely different conception of reality where science doesn't mean, you know, like providing these explanations that really explain the way the world is. Um, I, I don't know the best way to articulate what I'm getting at there but i'm like somewhere in between those like i'm i'm like maybe you know maybe there are like psychological laws or economic laws or something like that and they can only be 
a, you know, a, a full or a better science, you know, science that's more successful or what, uh, fruitful would be one that appeals to these entities that aren't reducible or don't feature in, you know, fundamental physics or something. Um, but that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to say science could go in that direction, but then it seems like the idea of, well, actually everything's just kind of appearances and a panentheistic God's idealist God's mind or something like that is just too different to, to, to that attempt to maybe provide explanations of things like economics or psychology or something by appealing to, you know, consciousness as like a, an, an entity that's not reducible. I don't know if that, if that. Yeah. Is I mean, I guess I, idea. I guess I, I would sort of disagree with that. I, I So, you know, Bernardo, say what you want about how he does philosophy. I think he is is doing philosophy and there is... Oh, philosophy, for sure. Yeah, I just yeah, mean, I mean the science, sorry. I mean, in terms of what I'd consider... Yeah, but I was going to get to the science. Okay, so he's clearly, doing, he's clearly doing philosophy. I think he takes himself as doing philosophy. But he also takes himself to trying to be fit, fitting consciousness into the natural world. And he takes himself to be using things from science to help his, like, I think his argument that relies on disassociation and that sort of stuff, whether you agree with or not. And when we had our discussion, I tried to empirically challenge him on this and try to give a debunking argument of the disassociation stuff. And he was kind of, I thought, you know, I thought you could cleverly say that, but why think it? But, you know, I think it's a little more than that. But anyway, so, uh, but still he's appealing to things that science has, you know, that some people think are scientific things like that um, uh, disassociation is a real thing and that there could be like a mind which is split into altered disassociations. So in that sense, that's a natural process, um, disassociation. If it's real, um, I don't know to what extent it is. Uh, well, at least, at least in the, the, this is kind of where I find there's a bit of a weird, uh, like a tension at least in, in some of the things he says, right? Because it seems that... I can understand why in the case of like, say, corpus callosum surgery or something, why you might think there's like separate, but then it, the, I, my understand, my explanatory understanding there is like parasitic on appealing to like neural structures, whereas mm -hmm. a global uh, brain or some, a, a global mind, I can't like appeal to physical structures in order to explain its operation or dissociative identities or anything like that. Well, that's so, right. But you could, uh, but you could appeal to the concept of disassociation, which you can which has some empirical support. More like a, more like a, a, a psychological phenomena of a, a something like that. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, and I, like I said, I, I'm a little bit skeptical of it. I mean, I've had disassociated experiences, but uh, I don't know about full alters and, you know, he's very impressed by these, this like fMRI uh, study where a person had a blind alter and in the case where she claimed to be in that alter, there was no alleged, no fMRI activity in the visual area. But when she was in her sighted alter, there was. Um, and so, you know, people have tried to debunk that by saying it could be that she was averting her eyes in, in a subtle way um, when she was in that alter. And that's why you see the difference in it. So I think there's, you know, still... But it is interesting if it's the case that a person who claims to be blind has this neural difference from the same person in a different case claiming to be sighted um, and saying they have no memory of the other case and they don't know each other. So I don't know if that's a real thing, then um, you could see how he applies it. But I don't know. So if what you're trying to do is explain the world out there, and you really are impressed with this theory of perception, which he uses a lot. And I think all of the people impressed by this use a lot too. This um, screen or dashboard or whatever the terminology that they use. If you start from there, then I do think that there is a point <laughs> that they are making, which, I mean, Bernardo uses this argument where he says it's like a painter painting a self portrait and then saying, I. Um, am the self-portrait. And obviously that's silly. The painter should be saying, I am what the self-portrait represents. Um, so the the difference between um, the Bernardo view of perception and I'd say the kind of Cogsci standard view of perception is in this screen of perception stuff. And whether the thing we perceive is the world itself, the, the stuff out there, or the stuff on the screen of perception. Um, and that's an old debate in philosophy that goes back to idealists like Berkeley and um, but even to non-idealists like Locke. But as soon as you get to that that starting point, 
where you say, all I know is my own experience and that's the only thing I really know, then I do think you have to ask this question, well, how do you get from there to the existence of something that's independent of your mind? Um, of course, the, the way out of that is to recognize the problem with the starting point. <laughs> where, where we start is not with our own mind, but with the world. The world's out there. Um, that's, that's where we start. And we can have direct contact with the world, even if what we're doing is representing the world and by in that direct contact. So I think what's called direct realism is not incompatible with representationalism. And that's been a move in, in philosophy of perception within the last 50 years or so, whatever. But anyway, so I think that, you know, there, there are arguments back and forth between these two yeah. camps. But I think a lot of the, of the appeal of idealism starts from this Cartesian enclosure of all I know is my experience. Um, and then you do have to ask these questions. I do, I do think it is positing something. I mean, this is what, you know, Barclay always said to Descartes. He was like, look, bro, I'm the real empiricist. You know, Barclay would say this, right? He was like, yeah, bro, yeah. I'm the real empiricist, Barclay, because I'm only talking about what I can see, taste, touch, and smell. Mm -hmm. You, Descartes, are the weird guy who says there's something beyond what I can see, taste, touch, or smell, this weird invisible thing that I can never see, taste, touch, or smell, but was allegedly out there causing I see, taste, touching, and smelling? Like, what is this? Where's the evidence for it? Mm -hmm. And I do think, yeah, you do. And then Kant comes and gives this transcendental argument. Well, it's gotta be something because experiences. So there, there's a big history of philosophy debate here, but the central idea is once you start from this theory of perception, you do have to make this extra step to what's outside of the perception. Yeah. So I, I don't think that's, and I, and I think they take that very seriously. So, you know, what really is the evidence or anything physical outside the mind besides more experiences? That's, oh, yeah, what, that's they're really impressed by that. I, I, I don't mean to be sort of accusing anyone of not believing what they say they believe or take, you know, like tech, like really being convinced of it. Um, but I think there's, there's something I'll have to think about it more. I was trying to think what it is that I find doesn't kind of fit with at least the way I think of naturalism or something. I think it's maybe it's something like, um, so in the case of say like certain views of a philosophy of mind that aren't uh, reductionist views, they're, they're still, you know, science maintains its role as, as um, central to our epistemology is like the best way of finding things out of, of firmly, seated in reality from top to bottom or something like that whereas it seems like maybe in Kastrup's view science becomes you know this thing that explains um regularity and appearances on the screen or whatever but actually you know the real reality is you know it, it, it's special in a it's disconnect you know science could be you could have appearances a bunch of different ways different sciences but the real reality isn't scientific it's kind of a way and, and I think that maybe that's why it doesn't quite sit right with me to consider it a natural, but maybe, a, you know, maybe that's do you, very, So just to press yeah. on that a little bit, uh, do yeah, you yeah, think yeah. of like um, Copenhagen versions of quantum mechanics are the same? Because like uh, those, I, I take those seriously, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. some people say the job of science is not to tell us about the fundamental nature of reality, yeah. but rather to ask questions, answer questions that we ask. Mm. So every question we ask, we get the right answer, but, it, but what is this? You know, this what this question of what the table is doing when we're not looking at it or measuring it. Like what's the, what we can say is what we're, what's going to happen when we look at it. That's what science does. It tells you it tells you what you'll see when you look at it. It doesn't tell you anything. It's not supposed to um, yeah. on this view. I'm not saying I really believe this. I'm just saying I take it serious. It's something to think about in this area where like so it's a really a debate about what the role of science is. Hmm. So it sounds like your view is that the job of science is to tell us about the fundamental nature of reality. And Castro or, or maybe not physical. Just, I think it's more an epistemic thing or something like that. It's like, um, you know, it, it, it's like um, that something remains, uh, you know, something become, we, we develop methods and tools for exploring that thing that become a science where then, you know, it's like a legitimate body of knowledge and, and we can refine it and stuff. Whereas it seems instead what happens on Castro's view is like the opposite thing where we, lose our ability to scientifically inquire about this like consciousness or metaphysical space and then it because you know and then there's like a special way of knowing that's not you know so so whereas on on Chalmers view of something I would think um you get a a, a 
better operationalized conception of what mind is that okay it's not it's not reducible but now i've got you know like i've got psychological laws or something and i have explanations and entities and things it seems like the opposite thing happens on castrop's view like the uh, all the science happens in the appearances and the real you know is like it, it, it is immune almost to that type of investigation something it, yeah i that, mean his that's the kantianism as i would see it that's and that was the debate that kant thought you know, was uh, that he saw that he Kant thought he, but I'm not a Kant scholar, but I have to teach it. Yes, so I, I have my own <laughs> views on Kant. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, so the debates in a sense between Barclay and like Descartes and Locke um, about whether there is anything beyond experience, hmm. uh, whether there, so, th so these guys all start from the same starting position. They're all like, okay, so all we know is for our own experience, you know, Descartes, Cogito, Ergo Sum. So they, we're here. And then we have to say, this could be a dream, this could be a whatever. It's, uh, okay, great. So we're, we're hosed in that way. Um, where do we go from there? Uh, and um, Descartes said, well, what's external to the mind is what we call physical reality. <laughs> and Barclay said, no, 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 that makes no sense. Um, physical reality is the stuff that's in the mind that we, that we bump into, it's this stuff, that, right? It's mm -hmm. everybody agrees that like this table, this computer and this, this coffee cup are like in my mind. Like, De I mean, everybody, Descartes, Locke and all those guys, they agree that th this is something in my mind. So the only question is like, how do I believe there's something external to it? Um, and so they're arguing about what the word physical should apply to. Yeah. Descartes says the word physical applies to that stuff that's outside of perception. Mm -hmm. And Barclay is basically saying, no, the word physical yeah. applies to the stuff in yeah, perception. Sure. Yeah. And Kant comes along and says, gee, you, you guys are half both right. So um, yes, the physical stuff, the word physical applies to the things in our experience, but there's still something beyond our experience, which we can't say is physical. We can't say is any, you know, so then you have to say, oh, my Lord, what, what the hell is it? But anyway, so the debate is like, what? Where is what is science really in the job of doing? And of course, mm -hmm. Kant's answer is it's in the job of predicting experiences. Mm -hmm. And that really you can see that in the Copenhagen interpretation right. that that's kind yeah, of basically yeah. they're in line with that. And I think that Bernardo's in line with that too. That yeah. the job of science is to predict experiences we'll have, not to tell us about what's really there, but we have to use philosophy to get at that or something like that. And, yeah, and so, so I get, if you, yeah, I mean, the, the I, thing about his view that I think is worth thinking about is that he starts with this idea that what we call physical is an abstraction. And then if you really think about that, what he's trying to say is kind of the stuff that I think we've just been talking about, which is that what we start with is, according to him, the experience. And then you do your Descartes thing and you go, huh, so this I could be having this experience when you know there's no physical world at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I think there's a physical world at all, what I have is this. So how do I get out of that? And then the physicalist says, well, you know, so so the idealist, the reason why there's all this rancor amongst them is because a lot of physicalists assume the physical world is there. And these guys are like, yeah, but you only know that by experience. As I said, I think there's a problem with that. Namely, they start with this theory of perception that has been de debunked. Yeah. Um, but I think if you have that theory of perception, this is a pressing problem. I, th I think maybe, maybe there then what would make me more sympathetic to like, Bernardo saying his views are naturalistic or something would be if he sort of helped me to understand um, what potential laws of the the unity consciousness that sits behind it all might look. You know, like it, is that something that would be the subject of study of, of basically a site? You know, like th there'd be ways yeah. of finding out and constructing a science of that and maybe generating yeah. predictions of it. Yeah. I didn't come here to defend Bernard. I know, I, mean, I know. Yeah, I know. No, no, <laughs> I, I just think I, I you're think doing a good job deal money. Yeah. But he, I think he, like, his view is that, like, neuroscience is uh, yeah. um, that. <laughs> so, you know, when I asked him about this, I was like, look, you know, there's what reason is there to think anything out there is mental? Like, we have these laws, they work in this way. Like, it, we never have to appeal to anything mental in the explanation of why physical thing out there causes physical thing over there. And, and he was like, you know, that stuff that we're describing is in our experience and it's following these objective laws, but yeah. it, it, like that neuroscience is uncovering, um, but that what we're actually observing is a law of like consciousness or mind. 
so that it's a little yeah. bit about finding out, like even finding out about trees growing and, you know, his view is that all that stuff is, yeah. is consciousness. So every science is going to be doing what it does on his, as far as I understand, it's going to be doing yeah. just what it normally does, studying the things that it's studying. But the only thing that's going to be different is that the it's trying to construct a, a, a theory of mind um, in an objective sense or uh, in the sense of, now you would say no, it's a theory of physical things, and there's where the debate begins. Like, well, I don't know if I would actually like. Honestly, I, I um like I'm sympathetic to. I can step outside of my own view and kind of see that like where he's coming from. I think there are just uh, these bits of it that I struggle to see how they kind of fit in, you know. So then it's like, well, you know, the I, I can so I can understand how you could appeal to the the regularity of appearances essentially in terms of doing things to brains or neural structures or coming across neural structures and they seem to be accompanied by consciousnesses um you know things like that but then i think the thing i struggle is like the two tiers so it's like well that's in our experiential reality now i'm making sort of the these um inferences about metaphysical reality underneath and then, and then i'm like well what you know does uh, from the base level of um unity of ultimate experience you know that of, of that experiential point of view um what's the relevance of these explanatory ro roles that make appeal to neurons and things and if there isn't a relevance between the two tiers then in what sense is this explanation an explanation that helps us to understand you know what's going on at that level as well and so right. and so that create so then and I'm I mean, I think I'm that's an important yeah. point because it's, uh, in my view, what you're getting on is that there's a similar explanatory gap or conceptual uh, uh, distance between like knowing the things we know and knowing what the ultimate mind is doing or whatever, which it seems like you should be able to predict if, if you really have the views that Castro has. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I think that you're, you're right. But uh, so, you know, my, my, my only claim here is that a idealism is not ridiculous it follows kind of straightforwardly from a certain starting point which is aligns with the thing i was talking about earlier which i'm interested in mapping these areas out so i do think that if you start from that theory of perception and follow this traditional path that it becomes very difficult to work your way out of it mm -hmm. um and that idealism is a solution or a way of trying to work yeah. your way out of it uh but you know so I, I want to get off the boat way earlier when we feel so confident about these a priori arguments, because really all when you read the stuff that Castro has, it's just like it starts from the hard problem, like hard problem, obvious, does. So what next? And, you know, I, I think it's interesting to, to look at what's next, um, if anything. But uh, if someone ever challenged me on like the why, <laughs> why do you start from the hard problem and move like to we need to do this, then I think that's where the issues begin. But once you are convinced of that, then I think idealism is a serious contender. And I don't, so, so I, what I'm against is like the mocking of idealism. And, you know, way back with the very first podcast that I ever did before I knew what podcast was, was me and Pete Mandic. And basically where I was like, do you think science has refuted idealism? Because I don't think so. And I, I just think it's an open possibility that mm -hmm. science has. And he was like, oh, come on. But, you know, he just said, yeah. no, I think it's refuted because it's silly. Basically, I think that's a quote from what oh, yeah. he said, not because of empirical reasons. I just like, I don't think it's silly. I think it's a serious response to these issues if you're moved in a certain way by certain considerations, which I happen to not be my <laughs> I mean, I, my, my view on those things is I I can kind of see both sides, right? Which it, So there's a whole discussion to be had there about maybe what I consider ridiculous kind of depends on the context because I can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So, so it's like, you know, maybe the, I forget, is it um, the, the bishop, whatever is it, the guy who got, when I refute it thus by kicking the uh yes. kicking the rock or whatever uh -huh. you know for, i think for, for most people that's going to be the bounds of ridiculous like maybe most ordinary people I, I would think i don't actually have any empirical evidence for that i should caveat but that that's my what's the my bounds of ridiculous that it's like, um, so, kicking some, the some, rock some, is ridiculous oh uh, no like, yeah like kicking the rock just demonstrates physical you know that that the, considering these idealistic uh, yeah that's it, that's a silly idea well, it is in the context of reflexive equilibrium, reflective equilibrium in the philosophy room, right? But I, I would think maybe for a lot of people, they're gonna. That's maybe what they mean by ridiculous. Like, I th maybe I'm, what I'm saying is, what ridiculous means is going to change in different contexts. And so I can see uh -huh. how for most things, what pe most things people are trying to do, they're going to be like, yeah, like I idealism, get out of here. But then when it comes to 
um, reflecting on our views and trying to build like consistent models of overall reality or something. It's like, well, actually, this does work. Um, you know, it all sits together. It's on the table still. That, or, or maybe other considerations, like you said, like it sits in a respectable tradition. So those might justify it in a in that kind of context as not being ridiculous by those criteria. Um, so I can kind yeah. of see both sides of. of, of well, I think it's not ridiculous by the first criteria either. Um, but I mean, so the, the kicking of the rock to like refute idealism is ridiculous. That that that's silly only because it doesn't take the argument seriously. On its own and terms. it's a straw man like that is literally a meme before memes were meme that is like a <laughs> straw like that is a you know a very poor representation of the argument that Barclay was trying to make and by the way Barclay and Bernardo are different because Barclay is subjective idealism and mm. art and, and objective ideals analytic yeah. idealism whatever yeah sure okay so anyway um well, so it's obviously I, yeah, I don't really begging. see it as ridiculous maybe, maybe or make even, it so it's it's obviously question begging construed in one sense, right? Which is to to say, like on the on the idealist own terms of um, you hit the appearance of the rock, right? Uh, so that that it's just consistent with my idealism. Um, I think that maybe there's a a different way that you could interpret what's going on there, right? Which is maybe in terms of well, in in ordinary life and experiences, I'm trying to do things, and when I try and do things. Um, I make appeal to certain types of things in order to do them. And so I just don't need your theory doesn't feature in my kind of like in instrumentalist or pragmatic conception of reality or something like that. Right. And then and wow. kicking a rock is supposed to be maybe an example of a very ordinary like type of physical activity people engage in. Maybe it's something maybe something along those lines is a. But then again, it's, that's probably not what most ordinary people would say who would rule it as ridiculous so maybe there's a few different ways of looking at it i, just, I just, i'm just just to say, I, don't, I can see where people are coming from when they say it's ridiculous and i can see where people are, i don't know how you resolve all of these views together I mean, yeah but, but i don't i think <laughs> most people are most i think most ordinary people are almost idealists and they just don't know it so like i teach this stuff all the time and i know you can't just assume because uh, your students over 20 years have said yeah. x and therefore x which is a common professor policy but still <laughs> my students over <laughs> many many years um <laughs> have uh what when you when whenever we're like um when you press discussing these things well i always give writing assignments where i have to talk about stuff and ask them reflect on things so i ask them like what is physical <laughs> and they almost to a person say it's that which we can taste touch and smell and therefore um because well, they're all is, pragmatists <laughs> yeah because they're all like it's this stuff <laughs> right here and that yeah. was barclay's argument yeah so yeah, whenever yeah. i read that i always say to them oh so there's um there's tables and chairs in your dreams right because you're tasting and you know, touching them in their dreams like oh no there's no tables in my dreams that's that and but but it's the, that's the whole point of their arguments it's the same experience experientially it's the same so if that's what you mean by physical object that and that's what got us into this we were talking about what do you mean by yeah, physical yeah. remember yeah, way back yeah. when um and so if what you mean by physical is just that what you can bump into and, and then you say what is the and you sort of start with this common sense notion look i'm going to grab something physical and it's this <laughs> mm -hmm. and i want to know what the nature of this is yeah. And whatever this is, it's nature. That's what I mean by physical. Mm -hmm. And if that turns out to be consciousness, then gee, I guess what I meant by physical was consciousness. Um, so I, in this way, I do think that like, this is where the 2D semantics of people like Chalmers comes in. I think if, if you think of different possible worlds as being the actual world, like bracketing, like where we are in conceptual space and going, okay, if that was the way the world was, and I was in that world, um, what he calls a centered world or something, if you like these fancy terms, then um, you can reason about things from that point of view. It doesn't mean it's true here in our world, but it would be like, what would be true if that were the actual world? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that these kinds of questions, if this were an idealism world, like Bernardo thinks the world is, then what we mean by physical would yeah, be so this stuff. That's what it yeah. would be. So if if in a person like the ordinary person, when they go around saying what's physical, that's what they would end up meaning. They might not know it. Just like when they say we physicalists think that when they are talking about water, they're talking about H2O without knowing it. Um, so I, I do think a lot depends on like 
what world you're starting at if you're going to define the terms in this way as like the stuff I can grab, mm -hmm. which is why part of me ultimately doesn't care about like how you define the term physical because like that's what I was trying to say way back when is like as long as it's not mental at the bottom, then I think you can rule okay. out Bernardo's views as being ones I think of as physical. Mm -hmm. But then also like on a more expansive notion of the word physical, I think it kind of almost doesn't matter. Like even in a simulation, it could still be the case that my identity theory was true, the mind mm -hmm. brain, that the brain being simulated was the thing that was right. important. So, so I, I think a lot of these questions kind of, depending on like how you start will, will come yes. out very differently, which is why I spend this long winded time trying to say where you start matters. Yeah, sure. um, no, don't, it's, I, I think we covered important topic, topics in that, uh, one question that we were trying to answer, but okay. yeah, I did, to, come, to come on to your own your own views a little bit, just because of obviously finite time as well. Um, so, so you mentioned as well um, the hard problem and your, and your views. You kind of briefly touched on, but do you want to give a bit more detail around how, like, firstly, what you consider the hard problem to be, um, it, you know, on your own terms, and what how you, how you respond to or resolve that uh, problem. Okay, sure. Um, remember, I still have a question for you, so don't try. Yes, to yes, we'll get. No, I won't try and escape. Don't worry. <laughs> I, but I'm, I, I'm just con conscious of. of there's no. I don't. Do you have like time after two o'clock? A little bit if we overrun, or do you have a pretty? Yeah, I, I can it? basically be around till three. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. And is that sorry? That's um. What? When is that three for you? Is that like an hour and a half? Like for an hour. Okay. Okay. Cool. Right. Yeah, no, I forget. Where are you? Uh, I'm in the UK, so yeah. Cool. I am. I'm on the island of Long. <laughs> yeah. No, no worries. Yeah, I like. I've I've got all the time in the world, but um. So yeah, I, I don't. I have kids work. coming from home and a and a wife who's <laughs> yeah. like, don't spend all day on the internet with me down here with these kids. I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> it is quite the contrast when you're like trying to have a rational discussion. And you're like, hey, leave the beat, and you go downstairs and like. <laughs> Chaos, <laughs> not rational. But we're trying to download civilization into their little brains currently as we speak. Um, okay, it is quite hard and they fight it uh, very strongly. Um, anyway, so uh, you're asking uh, me about the hard, hard problem, problem and all that kind yeah. of stuff. How, uh, so, so, so partly in the, in the way I asked the question as well was like, I, I wanted to get how you think of the framing of the question because I think obviously, sometimes people will introduce people in a particular kind of way but often when people have thought about it a lot they might want to be sensitive to certain ways that the question is even posed or highlight people's attention to yeah certain aspects of that exactly yeah so i mean i think the kind of generic and standard way to, to say the hard problem is just it's the question of why the physical basis of an experience is the physical basis of that experience as opposed to a different one or none at all um so that the, the idea kind of starts with the correlations between physical states and conscious experience. Um, and science studies these, and I'm involved in some of these debates, like what part is this experience correlated with? Is it a higher order part, a lower order part? How in the brain does that map onto these things? So, you know, we are still fighting about this stuff. It's not like this is resolved or anything, but we have noticed that there are these correlations. Um, between the activity in the brain and the experiences that people have. And we're starting to map out these correlations. Uh, and we have crude tools. fMRI is very crude, um, extremely crude, even though it's exciting and wonderful and new um, from, I guess, if things from the 80s can still be wonderful and new. Uh, it, it is a truly fantastic tool, but it's very crude. It's, and it works you know, on dead salmon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it, 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 I was just going to say, and there's all sorts of methodological problems, which haven't really been dealt with, I would say, by the field in a very serious way. Um, and, 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 you know, we've already seen the kind of replication crisis that happens in social psych, which I would probably expect <laughs> is more widespread than that. So we have to always be aware of this. Um, but we have other methods as well, by the way, more invasive methods. And, uh, you know, I almost wanted to switch into neuroscience because the more invasive methods answer these questions more interestingly, but I just, I personally can't do it. I, when I started working with rats, it's, you know, I'm, I was raised vegetarian. I'm a vegan. I love animals. I understand that experimenting on animals necessary. I will defend it actually conceptually, um, but doing it is another thing. 
Um, and it's, I know that's a hypocritical attitude and maybe, but uh, I, I don't think so. Um, so we could debate that. And people love to play gotcha games with the vegans. So I'm the all, always there for those gotcha games. Um, but anyway, so uh, the hard problem starts from the recognition that there are these correlations. And then also <laughs> that we can explain some things fairly well. Like we know, we think how to explain what a memory is and what the retrieval of a memory looks like. And we have models of that. Um, and people debate about whether it's long-term potentiation or some other, you know, the Krebs molecule. Like, so we know a lot of things and people debate about what the mechanism is and it's, you know, it's not solved science, but we sort of understand in a conceptual way what it would mean to have information represented in a format, have that format stored in a certain way, retrieve that thing, have systems set up to read it out and then produce certain verbal behaviors like, oh yeah, my shoe is over there. And then even tell stories about how there are systems that control the physical mechanisms and walk you over there and blah, blah, blah. So we don't have a completed story about that, but we kind of see how you could um, in the way that we were talking about earlier in terms of neurons connecting and it's like, there's this mechanism. And it's actually, once you start looking at it, it looks like just mechanisms inside mechanisms inside mechanisms inside mechanisms. And you're like, wow. Um, like there's this famous exp little robotics experiment where they build this robotic uh, uh, cricket and it's only got like uh, two sensors and three internal states. And it does pretty good at imitating the behavior of a cricket as far as like, if it hears a sound, it'll orient towards the sound and it'll move towards it only when the lights are off. Uh, and the idea is just that we're just really complicated crickets on some level like that. And that the surprising things we do is just like the trillions of parts that were made up of the mechanism. They're just so fantastically complicated. Um, Okay, great. And so you can just run through this whole story. Uh, but then you get to the question of, oh, so where does consciousness fit into this story? And the hard problem really is trying to start from this, this claim that there's a, a difference between um, those things that I was just mentioning, which look obviously associated with a function and the job of science is to look for the mechanism that performs that function. Just seems obvious that's what memory is. And even in the history of science, it seemed obvious that's what life was. The functions included things like reproduction and homeostasis. The debate was over how could something physical do those functions? So there is a way of looking at the history, even in, the, in those areas where things were recognizably sort of functionally analyzable in terms of structure and function, like we talked about earlier. Um, and then the question was like, how could something physical do that? So then later we sort of learned about DNA and people said, okay, so there's reproduction. We learned about metabolism. They said, okay, so there's energy. And so we learned a bunch of stuff that filled in those pieces of how those functions could be done physically. But we always sort of knew that what we were looking for was how these functions are performed. Like what's the mechanism? Um, so the, the question was, could, could it be physical? But when it now, the, now the grand finale, uh -huh. um, when it comes to consciousness, uh, there's at least, and I agree with this, um, there's at least the seeming of a separateness from function in the sense that you can kind of not obviously encounter any contradiction with imagining things being otherwise. Um, so, you know, the, the way I like to contrast this is like re using real neuroscience. So we know that when you see red, there's activity in the visual areas of the brain, culminating in what we think of as the V4, the fourth visual area, Ooh, fancy V4. Uh -huh. So there's activity in V4. Okay, so, but what is activity in V4? Well, that just means there are neurons that have ion channels, which are opening and closing, and there's potassium and sodium and chloride and these things are going in and out of these neurons in such a way that they produce what we call an action potential, which is an electrical discharge, which itself is just ion channels opening and closing along the axon, ions going in, ions coming out. So actually when you look in V4 and you say, what's so fascinatingly red about what's going on there? It's nothing, it's just action potentials, sodium ions. Okay, great, so wonderful. 
But then you think about hearing the sound of a bell or an oboe, not the same as seeing red phenomenologically at all, very different experiences. And you look in the brain and you go, aha, well, there, did you know there's auditory cortex? And there's even, uh, just like there's V1, there's A1, auditory cortex area one. And you can, oh, there's activity in those areas when you hear the sound and you go, interesting, what's different? And you look at it and you go, oh, gee, it's ions and sodium and potassium and gates closing. And it's, and then also, by the way, there are other neurons in your brainstem controlling your heart rate and breathing. And you have no experience of those, it would seem. Um, what are they doing? Oh, it's ions and sodium channels. And you just look at these and you go, what about this activity here would ever suggest that one of these is seeing red and the other is hearing a sound and the other is a non-conscious control of breathing? So how could you like look, what in that description implies any of that? And the answer is, it doesn't seem like anything, actually. It sort of seems like it could have been the other way before, before knowing any of this stuff. I might have looked in the brain and found out it was that activity in the brainstem that was there when I see red, um, as opposed to not having any experience at all associated with that activity. Or it might have been the activity here where my auditory cortex is that was associated with vision. So why is it these neurons acting in that way? when really they're acting in the same way. <laughs> and that's the surprising thing about neuroscience actually is that the more you study it, the more you sort of see is that there's not a lot that distinguishes these things. It's the timing, the firing of these patterns, at least as far as our neuroscience that we, you know, people will say maybe we have to change. But anyway, what we know now is that it's these patterns of activity and we understand in an abstract way from computer science, how you could encode information in patterns of activity like that. So we, in an abstract way, understand how the brain could kind of be a computer and compute various things and, Im and implement various functions, uh, um, so forth and so on. But it's not clear how any of that would be, why you would ever be led from any of that if you just studied that to realizing that what it's like to see red is like having that quality present and what it's like to hear an oboe is like hearing a different quality present. So in other words, it just doesn't seem to be a, the sort of thing which structure and function tell you about, which is why the master argument against physicalism from the Chalmers camp really is as follows, that science explains, physical science explains structure and function. Consciousness can't be explained by that. So it can't be explained by physical science. Now, the, where I would quibble is I would add seemingly. <laughs> Consciousness doesn't seem to be associated with any function, and therefore it doesn't seem like it can be explained by science. So I would I would want to claim those, uh, qualify those as epistemic, um, as opposed to like getting. Uh, and I think it was Chalmers knows, but I think it's real easy to to for other for people slide over that. Anyway, so I do think that that's that the more you study the brain, the more you are struck by how it's like all the same in a way. And actually, you know, if you had this certain kind of brain damage, the part that processed it sound would suddenly start doing color and then like it would now those neurons firing would be like seeing red as opposed to hearing the oboe so it's not like they're magic in that area they've got to be doing something but what they're doing looks like what everything else is doing so then the puzzle is to explain why the experience of red is associated with that as opposed to something else or you know it's like so that seems to me like a legitimate challenge and what a theory of consciousness in the fullness of time um, should be able to say something about. Uh, so I don't know. So that's what I think of as the hard problem is, is trying to say, to answer that question. Notice how even there, I think that the idealists like Bernardo have the hard problem. So they can't answer that question. They, they, they can't answer the question, why is it that this right. brain state is associated with red as opposed to blue or, they can they can only say what the neuroscientists say, which is we don't fucking know, dude, <laughs> because it's that's the visual area, bro. Like that's why that's I mean the best answer the neuroscientists have is this line label stuff. Well, it comes from the eyes, so duh. But that but no, by the time you get to color vision itself, you're way past the eyes, man. V4 is way past anything we would recognize as directly coming from the eyes. It's been through several stages of processing, back and forth. Anyway, so anyway. Um, I think that the idealists have this exact same problem. They, they can't answer this question and saying everything is consciousness or even saying consciousness is at the fundamental level like panpsychists do. 
you still get this question, but why this brain state? <laughs> why this pattern of activity? Why any of that stuff? And I would just, I mean, I was just watching this earlier for my YouTube channel for uh, this uh, Kevin O'Regan sensory motor and activism stuff. And he was like, this dissolves the heart problem. Things are squishy because when you press on them, they give, don't you know? It's like, but huh? <laughs> that's not solving the heart problem. That, that explains a bunch of other stuff. But the heart problem is like, why does it feel the way it does? As opposed to no way at all. Um, yeah, because so, you, can, you can frame that in terms of mechanistic feedback, but you still can't frame that in terms of an explanation of why it feels that way rather than any other way to experience exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. And so this gets us to all the Mary's arg Room's argument stuff, which is, you know, I, I watched your video on this. Before you invited me on, by the way, um, just because you said simple and convincing answer to Mary. Well, I'm, I'm, gaming the like, oh. I'm gaming the system as well. I'm trying to I'm trying to boost engagement. That's what that is. But we can talk about that in a second. Um, yeah, no. OK, but so it, it boosted because I, I, I came in. I mean, you know, sometimes to be honest, I tune in and you're like pounding on the table and singing off key and I'm like later. Uh, but some people like that stuff. So I'm not hating on it. I'm just saying, you know, sometimes it's not for me. <laughs> but I love that you feel comfortable enough to be able to do that. <laughs> And I know you got to kill time before people show up some way. So why not? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but anyway, so uh, what was I? I forget how I even got on all this stuff. Oh, but sorry. Um, uh, hard, hard problem. And um, so you framed the hard problem as you see it. And I think you've done a good job at not strawing it, though. I would say <laughs> in a way you've strawmanned it. Because when you, uh, not in a, in, a, in a terrible way, but in a way that will make people more sympathetic to physicalism, because when you describe... Um, <laughs> oh, I mentioned describe brains. The physical, well, not, not just that. You, you said, you know, when you study this stuff, you find out that there's a lot of complexity at this level, and then there's a lot of complexity at this level. And you gave too much detail. You've got to leave as much detail out as possible. Oh. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> so I think the detail matters. I see. I don't think that's straw manning. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, okay. I, 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 I meant that tongue in cheek. I'm being tongue in cheek. Yeah. So, I see. Um, so, what is your? But, but so, uh, but then to sum yeah. all this up, then I think that it is kind of you. It, it, you can frame this as saying that one way to put this is by noting that there's no a priori entailment between knowing about the physical facts and knowing about consciousness. Although parts of me on some days, I really start to worry about that and question it. And, you know, so I'm not fully, you know, like I said, when I defend things, I'm usually trying to work them out. And that's why we start, I like the way you started this conversation because the more I like dig in on something and push back on you, I'm really trying to figure out what I think about it and hearing what you say back in the comments that I'll read later and all that stuff helps me think through these issues. So it's not like I'm, super committed to these things i have things that i think i am committed to but i could be my mind could be changed yeah yeah um, but but so i do think this a priori entailment stuff is important um and that the hard problem is kind of wrapped up in in issues related to um the principle of sufficient reason and rationalism more generally speaking and this idea that what we need is an intelligible explanation one that's, that gives us a aha a yes a, a yeah, man, kind of feeling that we go, I get it. And that a lot of times what I encounter is that people say, I can't understand how it could be. So it's not. And that's the, that's the thing that I don't like the most. If I, there's one thing that I don't like in this, in these debates, the most, it's that kind of attitude and it's everywhere. It's from on every side. Um, it's like, I don't understand how that could be the case. So you're stupid. Duh. Um, and that, I get that because I defend the identity theory and people say, well, I, I, how could it be physical? And then they look at you, give you the incredulous stare. So I don't really think that's useful. It's like, I don't give them the incredulous stare. I try to think from their position. So it's like, um, yeah, anyway, uh, the, the hard problem I think is involved in this a priori entailment, um, kind of idea. And even those who deny like, like Ned Block, who I'm very influenced by, um, even those who deny that there is this kind of a priori link between consciousness and the physical facts, they kind of start with the granting of the intuition that at, at least as what we know now, and maybe you're right, that if we really knew all the physical facts, it'd be case closed. Um, and we would see how there's no room for this stuff or we change our minds or our concepts would be different by then. Or I think there's lots of ways it could go. But anyway, given where we are now, I think that, um, it's a bit tiresome to to deny 
the existence of consciousness or that this is sort of seems like it's different from a lot of other stuff because it does. Um, and in, and anytime I find people saying it doesn't, it's like they sort of do admit at the end that it does, but then we're just like, they were wrong about it, but they sort of do admit at the end. It does seem like that way. Um, but anyway, so that's how I think about the hard problem and whether it's going to be solved or dissolved uh, I don't know. So this is why when I wrote, I, you know, I never expected to write a paper on zombies and a priori arguments, but when I got out of grad school, someone came at me very strongly on my blog and they were like, hey, dumb shit, don't you know that physicalism is false? And I had never really encountered that attitude before. I was like, whoa, I'm a dumb shit and physicalism is false. I did not know that. Um, so, and they were like, it's false because of zombies, dude. Like, what the fuck? And I was like, whoa, I, I just never, I, I never, I, I was like, isn't this like something like, from history that we don't really take serious anymore. Turns out, no. So I had to learn about you know all of this stuff um, from there, and I came to see that it's it's not just name calling. There's there's something really I think serious um, about this. But um, I forgot why I brought that up. I was distracted by thinking about this debate. But uh, uh, anyway. so we're talk, you're, no, we're talking about that. So just your like solution to the hard problem. Oh I yeah, the one that's going to be solved or yeah. dissolved. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So when I wrote on this, which I didn't expect to do, which is how I got distracted, um, my approach was to do what I call deprioritize it. <laughs> so I was inspired by the discussion about marijuana and the police literature. So they were like, should we? decriminalize it or uh, deprioritize it. So deprioritizing is where you still say it's a, illegal, but you just say, we're not gonna enforce the law. So I was, my idea was that something like that we should do with these a priori arguments that um, well, we wanna deprioritize them in the sense that we don't wanna really trash on rationalism. I don't wanna fight them, I wanna grant them that. And I wanna say, even if you grant them that, you don't get the conclusion you want. And then I think there are reasons for that, but, by deprior so what I was trying to argue for was that we should deprioritize these arguments until we have more empirical data. Because the analogy I was trying to draw was with like Aristotle thinking about water and thinking of it as a simple substance with no parts. And how he just thought it was inconceivable that water had parts. He kind of says this when he's crashing on Democritus, when Democritus claims that water is composed of atoms. And Aristotle just like, what are you talking about? Like it doesn't, it's clearly a simple substance. But of course, now we know how to conceive of that. So um, in the fullness of time, I think that we will be able to a priori know, because I think we can a priori know that water is H2O. I, I was going to make a similar comment, I think, uh, as the, the one you're making, which is that I think maybe it's that the a priori here, there's like a kind of myth around it as if it's this space of pure reason with these given concepts that exist right. and don't come from anywhere or anything. Whereas exactly. I think the reality is quite quite different are concepts of things are really informed by the way that we're taught the concepts right um i don't just have like a pure essence of water so, you know yeah so for someone who's not studied computer science or something you could tell them a bunch of facts about um you know the way that logic gates or something work and then and, and you don't have to make it uh, you can make it analogous because i know the accusation will come well you're talking about the qualitative experience of seeing the computer screen or something but i mean you can talk about some function that a computer performs in terms of memory operations or processing lots of data or something it's like well how the hell do you get that from like just combining these things together like that you know people are not going to have the um intuitions in, in the a priori about that and that because you need to just learn a lot of stuff to have those intuitions of that is that similarly where you're coming from on that in a way yeah so uh what i would say is that if you want to know some a priori then it's got to be independent of experience so what does that mean well i don't know but let's just say that you know vision and introspection and things like that count as experience so do we ever learn anything <laughs> in a purely a priori way no all of our concepts are apply uh, are come in through experience and int introspection, you might think. Um, maybe there's some we could abstract that out of there that you can see how we're independent of that or go beyond it or whatever, but they, they all start from there. And um, the idea that, so I would say that we know that water is H2O a priori because, and I'm very much influenced by the work of David Chalmers on this, because there's a a priori conditional statement of the form if P then Q, which you could say, if the world is thus and such, where thus and such is filled in with the physics that we think is true, 
if the world is this way, and then you insert quantum mechanics, relativity theory, chemistry, all the, I mean, and a completed of all that, then water is H2O. And I think even if you didn't know whether the antecedent of that conditional were true, you still could. So you didn't have the experience and know if the world was that way at all. You could still see that if the world were that way, then water would be H2O. And you could know that a priori, so that an ideal agent who had no experience of our world or the way that it was could come to that conclusion um, in an a priori sense. Well, maybe they'd have to have experience to get the concepts. Who knows? But um, I think, I, yeah, they, I think that's they'd really be able to really reason really. their way without relying on that. Yeah, I like. I get where you. I, I I I do struggle with that just because I think of concepts and like 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 basically linguistic thought as having to be trained. So I I struggle with the idea that I so I can kind of understand what I'm imagining there, but I struggle to understand it in the sense of like, you know, I'm getting at almost like um, some pure propositional knowledge or something. Cause I guess I just don't think of like uh, a realm of pure propositional knowledge. I kind of think more of just contingent languages that people can think in when they're trained into them. So maybe I'd have mm -hmm. a harder time with that on, on my view, but I get I, like, I get what you're saying in terms of if you accept this competing view, then yeah, that's the way you think about the a priori, right? Is exactly well. This is what I'm saying is that I'd rather like grant this to the opponent rather than argue with them about it and show them that they still can't have the conclusion that they want, which okay. is that physicalism is yeah. false. So that's my strategy: is to say, look, I want I don't want to argue with you about all that stuff because on certain days of the week I'm kind of sympathetic to it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. even if you have all that stuff, you haven't shown physicalism is false. That that's my view. So that's what I think I'm trying to show here is that. So the way that we know that water is uh, H2O a priori in a sense is, well, first of all, empirically, we learned that water is H2O. <laughs> we didn't know it a priori. We, like us, humans here. So an ideal reasoner might be able to know that a priori if you buy this the line that they have. So an ideal yeah, agent who knew all the physical facts could reason from those to know that water is H2O. But we, us muddle-headed, non-ideal reasoners, didn't learn it that way. But even so, once we empirically figured out that water was H2O, now we can look back on that a priori conditional and go, oh, yeah, uh-huh. And if the world is this way, then water is H2O. So even we can know it now, like you and I, I think, know it a priori in a way that, you know, um, uh, Aristotle couldn't, or even the people who discovered that water is H2O if you want to put it that way. And by the way, I saw someone in your comments on this video mentioning um, – the Chang's book, uh, uh, is his book is like, yeah, I love that yeah, book. Yeah. I think everyone should read it. Um, I didn't know there were lectures on it, so I'm going to go and watch those. Uh, I thought I was very excited to find that out. So anyway, um, I, I think that you could tell the same story about like the dollars that Mary gets so that while she can't a priori know it in her room, she might come out and look at red, acquire the concept and then be able to a priori know it in the way that she would know this a priori conditional right. statement. Um, so I think that, yeah. Um, even if you grant them, they're all the premise, everything, <laughs> you still don't get that physicalism is false. And that's what all my business about shambies and all that stuff is. It's like, if you want to say that physicalism is false because you can conceive of zombies, then I think I can conceive of what you know I call shambies, physical creatures with consciousness and nothing else. And then it's like, well, if we're playing this game, they both can't really be conceivable. Yeah. So yeah, you right. either you have to give something yeah, up something's here, wrong. like yeah. something's wrong, and then it really the only difference between pounding of tables is like where you started from. So Chalmers kind of starts from dualism and ends up on the zombie side, and you know? I kind of start from physicalism, end up on the physical side. So given that people actually, in fact, disagree about whether these things are conceivable, and they both can't be, then isn't that evidence that something we should be a little more humble and recognize that maybe we're not sure which one of these really is the ideally conceivable one and that's that's my idea of prioritizing strategy it's like we don't know which one zombies could be the ideally conceivable one we might learn a bunch of science and then go oh yeah or we might learn a bunch of science and go yeah see they're not ideally conceivable here's how you a priori do it but it requires a lot of empirical work in the way that we learned about water and h2o and so sitting being aristotle and sitting around going mm, uh, it's just not going to cut it because we need a load more of science and in phenomenology i would say we need to actually know some stuff about experience 
So I, I just think it's premature to be going around trumpeting what reason does or doesn't show about this, because reason might show that physicalism is the one that comes out. It, it's, it's not clear. Uh, it depends a lot on how science goes. So that's my official view. That's why I say deprioritize. Like, stop arguing about what's ideally conceivable. We can't tell. And when you put that objection to the Chalmers types, he kind of goes, look, I know I'm not an ideal reasoner, um, but I sort of know a few things about what an ideal reasoner would say. And I go, eh, really? Okay. Must be nice to go to Oxford and know about ideal reasoners. But, you know, some of us go to community colleges and are unsure of ourselves. And there is a part of me that thinks that there is this difference between Chalmers and, and I, and, and in the sense that um, Chalmers was a mathematically inclined person who, you know, got a, he really did get a Rhodes scholarship to Oxford to study mathematics. And I am also, I would say, a mathematically inclined person and not getting Rhodes scholarships. And what's the difference? The difference is I'm not very good at math. I'm better than most people, but, but I'm not like as good as the good ones are. Where Chalmers is like on that level, I would say he's, he, he's on another He's on a higher plane as far as that reasoning is concerned and the clearness about how these connections are made. Um, whereas I only see them dimly through a foggy sh uh, shroud that I sort of can fumble around on, but I don't have this clear sense of the mathematical structure, whereas I think he does. So when I, I have this, so one time so I was arguing with someone and they were like, you don't know what, like this is about God now. They were like, you don't know what it was like to know everything. You can't talk about being omniscient. And I was like, yeah, I know exactly what it would be like to know everything. It would be like me already, but just being right. Because when people ask me a question, I spontaneously come up with an answer. <laughs> and to be omniscient is just to always do that right. You just always get the spontaneous right answer. Um, but me, I spontaneously come up with answers that I work through later, then find out they're the wrong answers. And math, math, I'm talking about math, not just about philosophy or science or anything. Just like, you know, people ask mathematical questions and I'll come up with an answer and then work through the Ds. I'll be, ah, dang, I left out this. I forgot a parenthesis in my head. I wasn't doing it right. So I've had the experience many times of feeling confident about some computation and having the experience of being wrong and then working back through it and being like, okay, now I really get it. But I don't think Chalmers has ever had that experience, honestly. I feel like he has more had the experience of always leaping to the intuitively correct answer in mathematics. Um, and then one uh, comes to have intuition. this trust. Yeah. Yes, this trust of their intuitive sureness that it just like, bam, that's got to be right. Because, and Kripke said this one time, I remember, because um, I had some classes with Saul Kripke. I was looking at to sit around and listen and ramble. But uh, he said one, like one time he was like, someone was asking me, he was like, what better evidence could there ever be than an intuition? I was like, <laughs> Holy shit. I, I think I, I think I've read I've read something about Descartes um, influences and clear and distinct ideas as well that says something similar about his uh, teacher Clavius or something who is like a really mm. good mathematician and, uh, and, and taught in terms of you know like you get a clear and distinct intuition of some mathematical concept and uh, this was like a, a a Thomist guy I was reading who was trying to draw this connection between how that affected then Descartes kind of quest for certainty and role of intuition and stuff so get maybe something similar going on there as well yeah exactly so just to finish my thought i was just saying that whereas i have the experience of intuitively thinking x and finding out x is wrong in a domain where there's absolute proof like mathematics whereas chalmers has the intuitive experience of thinking x and finding out yeah right it is x i think that transfers over to this other area where we're thinking about things and his, he, he, he feels a, a more on a sure ground than I do because I'm constantly second guessing my intuitive judgments. Um, but uh, that's why I try to challenge the, their intuitive judgments by saying, look, here's another one. Like uh, these things are physical. And sometimes when you say this to Chalmers, he says, look, most people like, how do you prove that zombies are conceivable? I don't know. Like most history is about how hard consciousness is to understand. I'm like, yeah, except for the other half of history where everyone's like, it's easy to understand. Like, the Hobbeses of the world, the Democrituses of the world, like they were out there as well. I mean, they were calling Hobbes the great Satan and everything like that because he was a physicalist who thought it was just like, you know, motions in the brain, that's the physical shit. So th these ideas have been out there and I don't think it's fair to say that one side has an intuitive, you know, claim on it. Um, so anyway, and I'm not trying to trash Chalmers or anything. I respect his mind and the way he does philosophy and, and, and you know, tremendously. Um, but, uh, I do think that he tends to overestimate like, you know, how humble he should be. <laughs> and what I've challenged him on, I've, you know, I, I shouldn't tell the story, but one time when I first met Chalmers and I was kind of really drunk actually, 
but uh, it's hard being a vegan at, at philosophy events when all there is is wine and no vegan food at the dinner. Um, so then you're just drinking all night and there's no food and it's lead to a lot of bad Richard Brown experiences, <laughs> actual real stuff. Um, but anyway, so we were out one night and Chalmers was just like, I guess he was coming to New York to like for his job talk, basically for, to end up at NYU. Um, he was just flirting with the idea. They were trying to get him to come, you know, and I, as we know, he's been here for a long time, but anyway, so he was just coming, he was giving a talk at the grad center and we went out afterwards. Like I said, I was pretty liquored up. Um, so I wasn't, you know, being as you know, responsible as I should have been, but I remember like I, I, I made a bet with him that night about, and I lost that bet down it. But anyway, so, um, I, I asked him, I was like, look, dude, are you just someone who's really smart and came up with this wackadoo idea? And like, you're like, here's an argument that I can make. And that is, you know, airtight argument. but like, do you really believe this shit? Like, do you honestly believe that consciousness is like fundamental and not like, I was like, dude, like just straight up, dude, like for real, bro, like seriously. And he, first of all, he was like, that's insulting. Um, and I was like, okay, you know, so I'm drunk, but uh, like, honestly, like do you, and I, I kind of have become convinced that, yeah, no, it's because I, I was so convinced. Like, I was like, how could you, like be so convinced by your own, I don't get it, that you are like. Maybe you were the inspiration <laughs> for the incredulous stare. Maybe that's what he was. Yeah, referring. right, exactly. Maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but but I don't think it's disingenuousness or cleverness or, you know, because then it makes some of these accusations sometimes too. It's like, it's just word games. It's just schmess and third chess. And, and I, I don't really, I, I think that maybe it could be that in some cases, but I don't think it's that in a lot of cases, not for Bernardo, not for Chalmers, and not for a lot of people. I think that there's a deep yeah. interest and curiosity Principal about consciousness. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That there's a, you know, and Chalmers, the story about Chalmers is that he was a dedicated physicalist until he had some weird experience where he realized <laughs> that he didn't see in, in 3D or something like that, that he was having right. 2D vision yeah. or something, and then he got it corrected and the world changed, and he was like, holy shit, consciousness. So, I, I mean, maybe that's a character, but I, I do think that he is really puzzled by these things and that honest intellectual persons are puzzled by these things, even if I think that we could explain some of this stuff by their, you know, background biases or stuff. I don't think that really undermines the the argument. I think it kind of undermines the force that a lot of people take the argument to have, <laughs> which is why my deprioritizing strategy. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so uh, I, yeah, I, I don't think that. So part of me thinks that a way this could go is that in the fullness of time, our concept of consciousness will have changed. Yes. So that the hard problem will be, yeah, it's will, just will not have a functional. Yeah. But to do that, you would have to have a functional, or, I mean, I don't even see how you could do it because you'd have to somehow, yeah. talk, in the concept of consciousness, have it have a, a hook, a connection to all of this stuff in the brain that we can't see how it would. Well, I think this or is a little it bit could go like, as follows, or it could go, it just is. And I think my mm. considered view is the brute identity view, the one that I think I, I think just the most like mm. umph to it is just like some things just are, <laughs> uh, and it might just be a brain state. And I don't think that anyone's bafflement about how it could be counts against it. I I think that there's almost a, a whiff of the like epistemic Mino's paradox thing going on here. You know, it's, it's something like. Uh, you know, if, if you already know it, then you know what the thing is. But how could you know what you don't know if you don't know what it is because you don't know what it is like kind of thing. And it, it, yeah. it, it's like and I think that that is it, it's there's like a false dichotomy there because you're kind of get, you know, you get some grasp of a thing, but maybe not the full thing or, you know, there's a gap in you. And I think that it's more like that. But I think that you reflect on it and you think, well, yeah, really, what would the right sort of explanation look like? You know, you identify there's this epistemic gap in your explanation. You're like, yeah, how, what would the right, but if you knew what the right sort of explanation was, well, then the problem would be solved. So it's kind of almost exactly. a trust that you'd get to that point. Um, is there anything kinda, else on the whole problem point? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, I just said it's kind of related to the Kripkean paradox of dogmatism, where it's like, if you know something, then you shouldn't be looking for evidence against it. But of course, being shut off to evidence is a weird thing. So like there is a weird, um, there's a weird paradox there. I think I think you're, it's I think it's connected to that. But anyway, so I don't mean to, to cut you off. So, is so, there um, do you do you want just because of time to move on to then like my the the video I made about the knowledge argument? I will yeah. I will caveat up front that this is that's not my entire view on the knowledge argument, uh -huh. right? But I, I but I think that that is at least one tool 
for people to think about it where I think they can see one of the funky things. I think there's a number of funky things going on in the knowledge argument, right? Um, some of them to do with people's understanding of, um, you know, what words like possibility mean and different ways of interpreting those and things like that as well. Um, and also the role that intuitions play in kind of like conceiving the case as well. And that I think that when people reflect on things, they might be driven to an overall consistent view where their intuitions are actually slightly different, right? And um, but the main, but what, but one of the responses that I was making, and this is something I often do, is I'm I'm kind of sympathetic to a type of uh, a type of type I, a type of identity theory, not a type identity theory, but a type of identity theory, right? Where mm -hmm. I think what I often do is just accept the term. I, I think there's probably something wrong with the terms that the debate's framed in, right, in the first place. But in order to highlight this to people. I'll often kind of just accept what a lot of people consider to be almost the worst physicalist theory or model, which is going to be some kind of identity theory, right? I know you can still hear me, by the way, so I'll keep talking. Yes, um, you keep going. I'm just <laughs> opening a window because you're catalyst. No um, and and so what I what I often do there is I'll just basically go about showing how someone who adheres to this type of model would handle all of these cases like different intuition pumps or different um things that it's alleged the theory needs to explain right and i'll show how it explains them all but i'll also be super honest about the gaps and problems so you know like the amount of bruteness or maybe the amount of kind of mystery that remains in the explanation and then i'll just say but then i compare that right to these rival theories and it's you know it's kind of like the churchill democracy argument it's like yeah this is a really bad theory right now but it's actually kind of better yeah. than a lot of these others. <laughs> and so, and so I agree, like I, I would much rather have a better, more fleshed out theory, or I'll, in, I'll try and interrogate the terms the debate's framed in to figure out, have we made some wrong step um, that's leading us to have weird, you know, just consider like a weird problem that's not a real problem or something. But if we, if we do get to that stage, I'm like, I still think you actually solve it in this direction. And then that's where on the knowledge argument, one of the things I was saying, and you can, you know, um, pick up if you think there's a problem in this response, um, is that I think something that you can reflect on if, you, if you're going to accept some kind of identity theory is that basically um, having propositional knowledge or, you know, ha have, having belief states is a particular type of state to be in. You know, you're, when I consider the cat is on the map, um, then I'm in a particular type of state. But my experience of the cat being on the map is, is you know, a diff another state. Maybe you want to call that an E state or something if you want to predicate the two to make it clearer. So you can say there's like a K state, which is a knowledge state, an E state, which is an experiential state. And maybe what's going on in that case of, of Mary is that you consider her in all the K states, but then that obviously doesn't entail that she has all the E states because she'll only have the E states that she was stimulated to be in. And then... Um, someone might respond to that in a certain way. And I think that all the options for how they would respond to that, to say there's a problem in the way you're conceptualizing it, lead to an overall, you know, you either end up basically saying, well, then she is in all the states, right, as well. And uh, actually, then of course she has the experience, she's already had the experience when she steps out of the room. Um, and so whichever way you go, there's not a problem. So that's uh, to, to clarify what, what I said about that and my kind of views. Cool. Um, so first of all, uh, type identity theory is not the worst kind of physicalism. It's the best. Uh, I don't I think there's any reason to, um, very little reason to think the type identity theory is wrong. And m most of the reason for thinking that comes from thought experiments. <laughs> this is something I was just arguing with uh, Eric Switchkabel about on my channel recently when he came over. But I really take that seriously, that, um, that the only counterexamples to the type identity theory come from fanciful thought experiments and that in fact surprisingly <laughs> uh, the more we know about stuff the more we're finding that there's the same kind of states it's the same kind of physical hardware doing the same kind of job um and uh so i, I do think that this multiple realizability and stuff um doesn't really hold much water um at least until we have some plausible examples on the table uh, okay, so, you know, I'm still for type identity theory. I think type identity theory is a serious view and that people have dismissed it too quickly. So um, I didn't mean to dismiss it. I'll, I'll highlight by saying I didn't mean to dismiss it as well, but I just <laughs> think there's so much there's so much baggage that comes along with it, though, because I think I think there's basically going to have to be some, even with a type identity theory, there's some sense in which you're not saying the exact same physical state, right? So that's going to have to be clarified because there's going to be, you know, maybe 
it, it, maybe the physical state is a particular kind of thing, but maybe there's a different number of, you know, potassium protons on one side of a neuron in your brain to mine. And we still say, you know, so you're going to have to account for that. And maybe there's some degree of private, oh, not private, but some experiential um, di di difference as well. And you're going to have to account for that. And we still call them both, you know. Yeah, I think you can do all that, you know. Yeah. I think science already done that. So, you know, we have subtypes already in science and there are subtypes of water. No one goes around saying water isn't, well, some people do. But the water is H2O, but what about deuterium? Yeah. H3O, homie. Um, so it's water, but it's a subtype of water. And it's you can see that it's a subtype because it's recognizably related to the arch overarching type. But anyway, so I, I don't want to get distracted about the identity theory, I, but I'll go all, all, all about this all day because I, I really think that the identity theory has been wrongly maligned. Um, anyway, so, uh, but I, you know, token identity, I, you know, I, I, I think that's really functionalism actually. Um, and uh, I think you might have questions about causal powers and which level is doing it. So I, I, I really think the simplest view is type identity, um, but that's, you know, people can debate about that. No one cares. Um, or maybe someone cares, but we don't care that they care. So the point, though, is the the knowledge argument. I, I don't really think that you did justice to it, and okay, sure. uh, I don't really think that this response, as much as I love the identity theory, I don't think that it is even addressing the issue. So the um, the the issue is about whether Mary has new knowledge. Um, so do you think she does? You're just going to say not, it's e-knowledge, right? Well, it, de it, it, it depends because I can think about it in different kinds of ways, right? So it, it, it depends on what I th I'm conceiving of when I conceive her learning all the facts in the room. So I, I'm either going to conceive of Suppose her, that we can okay, find yeah, it to yeah. microphysical facts. To microphysical facts, yeah. I think that she will gain new knowledge, I think, when she goes outside the room. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. So I didn't get that from your response just a second ago. But so then you have to say what kind of knowledge. Uh, so then there's the two kinds: knowledge how, and knowledge that. So I think that's kind of where your response is going: is that she she learns maybe um, something that's not a knowledge that, uh, but is more like yeah, uh, yeah, uh, what, uh, yeah. Okay. Like or or maybe uh, maybe I'd even create a new type or something. I'd say like a, a know what it's like or something. If uh, you know. It, it, okay. So what I what I think that you're not doing justice to in this characterization, which maybe because you don't think it needs to be justice to, so I'm not saying you're wrong or, or this is sure, bad, sure. but I'm just saying I think that this is like where the other side is going to respond, um, is the idea that there is a, a kind of fact that she comes to know, whereby you can say that she learns her experiences like thus and such. Um, she comes to be to to, and that's a that's a claim that she can make about her experience. Seeing red is like thus and such. Uh, where she invokes the mental quality that she's now had contact with. Um, and she can form a concept of that mental quality called phenomenal redness. And she can say, oh, seeing red is like phenomenal redness. And that's a truth claim that it's something that could be true or false. Um, because, for example, you could think about invert Mary, <laughs> a little twist on the subject here. Invert Mary is just like Mary, but has inverted red and green experiences. So when Mary comes, inverted Mary, so when Mary comes out, she sees the tomato uh, or tomato and has a phenomenal red experience and forms the thought seeing red is like phenomenal red. Um, whereas inverted Mary, whose color experiences are inverted with respect to regular Mary, comes out, looks at the tomato, has a green, what we would call a green experience, but then thinks the thought seeing red is like phenomenal green. She doesn't say those words, but she's this quality is the one that's there that she's that's in this thought. So their two thoughts um, are are different. They have different truth values. Um, they're not the same. And so when Mary learns that seeing red is like this phenomenal quality, um, under the, and you employing the concept, you know, phenomenal red to to have the thought, seeing red is like this phenomenal quality. Uh, she learns something new that she didn't know in her room and she learns it on the basis of the experiential state. But the thing that comes away from it is a fact, something that has a truth value, something that can be right or wrong. Uh, and that's what she didn't know in her room. 
So, so how so does your I, response address yeah, yeah. this kind of primary thing? So I, I, I think I, I kind of I, I kind of understand the objection, but I'm not sure exactly how it fits in maybe with how I'm conceiving of the argument, right? So maybe, uh, so if I step through things and just try and like kind of help me out here, right? So I'm thinking that one of the premise that that one of the premises of the argument is going to be that um, you know something like physicalism is true, so uh, necessarily all of the mental facts that there are are determined by um, you know, physical facts in some sense. It doesn't, you know, it's going to be in the loosest sense possible um, because you want to kind of encompass all physicalist views here. So supervenience, whatever, something like Wait, that. Wait, this right? is going to be a premise in the Mary argument? I, I think so. True? Yeah, I, th I, th I think so, right? Because because you, you're, you're trying to construct this um, case where then basically a, a way of translating that is going to make to be to make this claim about possibility where it's impossible to know all of the... Um, physical facts, the micro microphysical facts, and not know some fact um, about mental states because there are, you know, so it's so it's basically going to be a translation from like physicalism or whatever is this metaphysical claim about the necessity being understood in this way, and it follows from that. Then you've got this claim about the possibility of knowledge, you know, of, of knowing all facts, and and it, it's impossible to. For, for there to be some mental fact that isn't kind of an entailment of that body of knowledge or something, right? Is that so? That's that's all, all right so far. Um. So then the idea was. Wait, she, hold on. I think I missed maybe misunderstanding okay. something you're saying, Nathan. Um, because I think an assumption of the argument is that the physicalist is committed to that. Yes. Therefore, yeah. That's what you saying. give the yeah. but that but physicalism itself is not a premise of the argument. It's just that the physicalist thinks this is yeah, all if, there is. Hypothetically, sorry. Yeah. If physical, so physicalism is this. If if yeah. that's true, then it's important. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. I didn't. Sorry. I didn't mean like a premise is like physicalism is true. I'm just saying like I see. I misunderstood. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, yeah. and so that so then the idea is, she 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 steps out of the room, and I and I'm saying I guess that that claim about physicalism is all of this um about knowledge or propositional knowledge or whatever right um and so the idea is because she learns a new yeah so so you have the intuition she she learns a new fact and that's a that's a particular kind of phenomenal state so now there's a new proposition this is what redness is like and that, or there's a bunch of propositions. That's just one of them. Sure. So one of yeah, them. But just, just for my cognitive abilities, though, I can't think of them all at once. <laughs> just, okay. just, just yeah. to get one of them. We go. Um, yeah, seeing so, red is like this, or yeah. seeing red is like phenomenal red. Okay. Like that and the idea quality. is, and the the idea is that's a truth apt proposition, and it wasn't covered by um, all of these other cases or something. Like well, she that. couldn't but, know it. I, I let yeah, well, yeah, you buy that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I get, I get that actually. I, th I think that makes the so, so the mistake is not. So this is something because I know you were like in. You didn't say this just now, but in the video you mentioned Churchill and stuff, and I think that the, at the pregnant you got like the getting pregnant versus the theory of pregnancy. That's an irrelevant issue, in a sense. So the 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 claim of the non physicalist is not that studying this would put you in that experiential state. Sure. But rather, it would allow you to see the truth of this this propositional claim. Seeing red is like phenomenal yeah. red, and she can't. She just yeah, has no it, idea what seeing red is like. Well, as like, just just as long as um, this is what red is like is a truth apt proposition, right? You, yeah. And you sign up to this other premise that it's impossible for there to be a truth apt proposition that isn't an entailment of microphysical facts. You've now exactly. got exactly. Yeah, yeah, I get, I get that. Exactly. I have to, yeah. I th so, um, I so there's ways out. I'm not saying you yeah. should be convinced by this. I'm just saying I don't think oh, that the it. response. Yeah. Oh, but the experience is different than the not than propositional knowledge because of different states. Really gets at the heart of the matter because the question is like, what does she learn? No, I agree with that. Because, I think, but I think if you say she learns an ability or something, then you're kind of denying that she yeah. like learns this thing that she can think this thought that seeing red is like this or like this. This is what it's like to see red or whatever the case may be. And I just get the intuition very strongly that she could think those thoughts. And you could even do versions of this uh, where she doesn't even have to come out of her room. So, you know, Mary in her room has she's not a zombie. She has conscious experience. She sees black and white. Um, so she has the phenomenology of black and white. She hears sounds. 
So she has the phenomenology of sound. It's not built into the experiment that she's like an experienceless robot. She's like a weird human. So she has human experiences, but just no color experiences. So she'll know, like for example, that middle C in a certain pitch, she could sing that in her room. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't do it, but you know, she could yeah, yeah. sound the note. And then two minutes later, sound the note again, and then recognize that they're like the same phenomenologically. So she could have this concept of being the same phenomenolog phenomenologically indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. She could know that that shade of black was phenomenologically indistinguishable from that shade of yeah. gray under a certain light. So there's a lot she could know in her room. And from the science that she's allegedly allowed to know, she would be able to know because she's you know super mm -hmm. scientist. So given that, she wouldn't even have to leave her room because yeah. she could be thinking about two individuals outside the room and not know. So she could know that ex uh, subject A is in brain state, you know, B in 42, 41, and subject B is in that same brain state and not know whether they have phenomenologically indistinguishable experiences. So she doesn't even have to see red. All that stuff is kind of like a red herring. She doesn't have to have the experience. Sure. The, qu the question is about whether knowing all that stuff is enough for you to be able to know the truth mm -hmm. of the statement. Seeing red is like this quality. And yeah. it just sort of seems obvious once you put it that way, the answer is no, which is why a lot of people want to deny that you get that kind of knowledge. <laughs> and that's why one sure. major response, you either go, well, she gets that knowledge and it's like phenomenal concepts are weird, dude. Or you say she gets that knowledge, but it's know how, not know that. Or she gets that knowledge, but it's knowing an old fact in a new way. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of ways you can still try to yes, weasel yeah, yeah. out of this. But I still think that you have to say, no, yeah. it's it's different than just like learning the equation should make you go into the sure, brain state. Sure. That's not the argument. Yeah, but yeah. I, no, I, 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 and I'm not saying anyway, so you know. No, no, no. I, th I think that that was actually, um, that's helped me to, to clearly understand the argument in, a, I think, a stronger way. Um, I definitely want to articulate in that stronger way and think about how, like, how not not how I handle that in terms of just preserving like the conclusion, right? But I want to reflect on that because I think there's something fishy about this and the role that that's playing, and um, yeah, how but, that fits in with my view of propositions and so forth, and what I think. And I just say like, that the yeah, use yeah. of the word "this" is not supposed to. So, so I don't think that the "this" is an indexical term in a fancy philosophical language. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you can really that that's what's doing the work here. Because remember the invert Mary and the Mary, they are going to use the word this. They're going to say, this is what it's like to see red. Mm. And they're both going to do that. But they're going to be pointing this thing, <laughs> the this thing that are pointing. Things. Yeah. So one's well, from one's one's. Well, I'll think about what. So I it's, think it's not about that. It's, it's, it's what Chalmers <laughs> calls a pure phenomenal concept where you pick out the conscious experience by its conscious nature, by what it's like. <laughs> not by a this, yeah. but by it being phenomenally red. So that's what you, you pick it out by. That's why, you know, people like Goff talk about transparency and all that stuff. Hmm. And I don't agree with them necessarily, but I, I do think, I that, think that this I, is I do, how they pick it out. I do need to think about that a bit more, though, because I think, you know, that the idea of, of of this referring to the phenomenal state and saying, like, this is what's red, red, like, I'm not sure if that would shift me towards, like, well, she, she obviously already had. Um, a kind of knowledge of like the phenomenal state of red, but it's presented to her in a new. Like, I need to think about what I think about that. Yeah, that's and, the, the new fact, yeah. old uh, right. new way of knowing an old fact. And but also so that, with with the additional case that you raised of um, inversion as well, I need to think about well, what are my intuitions about that case as well in terms of even mm -hmm. whether whether I'm going to think it's possible given my construal of physicalism or not. I'd need to just reflect on that a bit and think. Do, you know, what do I need to do with that information and what, what are my intuitions in that case? Because I'm not 100%. That's sure. why I think the best answer is that she comes out, acquires a concept mm. which she didn't have before and then would be able to do the a priori deductions. Um, uh, because yeah, that's yeah, what you, yeah. you can't your... like do the water H2O stuff without knowing the concept of water. It just so happens that, you know, consciousness, you got to have the experience to get the concept. But once you have the concept, yeah. then I think the story is different. So, so, uh, yours, so. Is, is that response that essentially you only have the concept with if you've had the experience then? Is yeah. that like, like mm -hmm. the, the note? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. So, and, you know, I think that there's a real sense in which the pure phenomenal concept can only be had when the stuff is there. So, like, for me, I think of myself as aphantasic. So uh, I can't like, I can't close my eyes and picture red. I just can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I see red all the time. 
And when I like, like I have these red scissors off screen here and often I'll stare at them when I'm writing about this stuff and be like the redness of red, like, the redness of red. So it's like, I, I don't think you can really like when it's not, and I, since I can't just call it up in my mind, yeah, yeah. I can't, I, there's nothing for me to get a grip on unless the thing is there. Mm -hmm. And then you form the thought, this is what it's like. And the, this is capturing the, the phenomenal quality. And I don't yeah. think the aphantasia stuff has anything to do with like, the the quality i can do it just as fine when the tomatoes in my hand or the scissors are there yeah. so it's it's still the question of that's what it's like so you know even though i'm kind of persuaded by transparency and stuff and i have wondered if i wasn't aphantasic would i still be influenced by transparency of consciousness and thinking of the qualities out there i don't know but anyway mm -hmm. i still think that all the same issues come up and that mary still learns something new even if she was aphantasic she would mm -hmm. still learn something new i mean aphantasic mary might yeah. be an interesting case where she can like see the red, but then later she can't like picture it or image it in any way. And then would you say when she's like later that day, is she still knowing what it's like to see red if she's aphantasic? I would say no, not until she sees red again in a real, in a, in a pure sense of the case that matters for the argument. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, no, I, so there is no, I appreciate I'm not saying, yeah, I'm not saying yeah, you're yeah. wrong. I'm, I'm not trying to come at you. I just thought I know, that. No, no, I agree. I, there's that my views are not, I, I'm not Mary. My room, my views have room <laughs> to uh, be improved upon. So actually, I, I appreciate um, when people raise things that are like blind spots or things I've not considered, and it makes me grow my views and stuff. So I actually appreciate Yeah, cool. That. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I hear downstairs people are yelling for me. So let me let yeah, no you worries. go. But also let me say before I do that, you know, I, I don't know much about you. I've never met you in real life. This is the most interaction we've ever had. But and like I mentioned before, I've seen some of your videos. And I know a little bit about your history, about how you started studying philosophy and then I guess mm -hmm. became disillusioned and how before that <laughs> you were a believer and were brainwashed by Jordan Peterson. So I've seen some <laughs> of the things that you've done and, and seen your history. And yeah. I just want to say that, uh, I think you're doing a tremendous service for philosophy, actually, whether you're in school or out of school, whether you're formally studying this stuff or not, it's clear to me that you are a philosopher. And by which I mean someone who's deeply struck by these issues and wants to reason their way to a, a rational, self-justified conclusion, whatever that for you equilibrium turns yeah. out to be. And doing it in public, in front of other people is, is courageous. And so I really think this kind of public philosophy that you're doing, whether in a university or not, whether you ever got back to college or not, this is real philosophy that you're doing. And so I, you know, I, I, I hope that ultimately your, your, your intellectual curiosity, whether you think of yourself in this way as a philosopher or not, mm -hmm. doesn't die out. And that this experience in academia, which I know can be crushing in many ways, <laughs> uh, hasn't extinguished that flame. So I'm glad mm -hmm. to see that it's coming back and I'm, you know, I'm flattered that you thought of me as someone that you'd like to talk to. But I just think that these conversations you're doing are, are so very important amongst people like me, but also just the general conversations that you have. So I just want to say, you know, I'm grateful for the content that you make and that there are people like you that are doing it. So thanks. Well, thanks. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, it, that's uh, really nice to hear. So thank you. Um, anyway, I'll let you go and spend time with your family um, away from thinking about these things. And, uh, yeah. yeah, thanks yeah, like for my, my, my uh, eight-year-old son says consciousness is bad for you. So, you know. <laughs> and, and your channel for people who want to want to check it out. Do you want to, uh, what one more brown, right? Uh, oh, the YouTube, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, don't, yeah I, don't, I don't know the name of that. I think it's like one more brown philosophy or Richard Brown philosophy or... If you just Googled my name, it would probably come up. Um, but uh, my blog, Philosophy Sucks. I also have a podcast, Consciousness Live. You could probably just search for that. Um, it's mostly on YouTube nowadays, but sometimes it's also audio podcasted. But uh, yeah, I guess I should know. I don't really know what my YouTube channel is. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, it's no cool. problem. I'm sure people people find it, and I'll link it in the description as well. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks, cool, everyone. but I'm open. To, I, people come and talk to me about this stuff. This is what I'm interested in. So I appreciate all viewpoints. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so I'll end it there. Thanks, everyone. Cool. See ya.